Good morning. Good morning. January 27th, 2023. Welcome members of the public to the California Reparations Task Force 12th public hearing, fourth in-person public hearing, and first public hearing of the new year. So thank you all for coming and being a part of history. Uh, before we uh, go into the substance of our agenda, uh, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson uh, for a roll call vote so that we can establish a quorum. Present. Madam Chair is present. Vice Chair Brown. Present. Vice Chair Brown is present. Member of Bradford. Here. Member of Bradford is present. Member Grills. Present. Member Grills is present. Um, Member Holder. Member Holder is present. Member Joan Sawyer. Here. Member Joan Sawyer is present. Member Lewis. Here. Member Lewis is present. <coughs> um, Member Montgomery Stepp. Here. Member Montgomery Stepp is present. Member Tamaki. Here. Member Tamaki is present. Madam Chair, there are nine task force members and the number needed for a quorum is five. The number present is nine. Madam Chair, a quorum has been established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Now that a quorum has been established, this meeting is officially called into order. Our next item on the agenda is welcoming remarks from the California State Secretary of State, Shirley Weber. Thank you. I bought one of my fans. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now you can sit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me, first of all, welcome you to San Diego State University. Um, I, I'm pleased to be here because this is a place where I spent 40 years teaching. And so it is always good to be home and to see so many of my former students who passed my class clapping. <laughs> because there were some of you who left. Okay, I understand that. But let me just, it's good morning to you. Uh, we put, brought the sun for you because, and it, of course the wind as well. But I'm just here to really to welcome you to San Diego State, make a couple of comments concerning the reparations. Um, it is my honor really to be with this task force today. This has not been an idle task force, it's been an active task force addressing some of the most important issues in California and they deserve a round of applause. In 2020, it is amazing to me that it's been three years now. In 2020, I authored AB 3121, which was the reparations bill. Um, and many persons asked why did I do that at that time? Well. I did it because one, the, the bill in, in, in DC once again had failed. And it'd been 40 years. And we know the history of the numbers of 40, 40 acres and a mule, 40 this, 40 that. And we never seem to get across the line for progress and efforts to make a difference in, in the United States and, and, and across the nation. I also decided that California could do this. You know, California is the one that always does the innovative things that others have, haven't done. That we could do this. And I knew that we had a legislature, because I was in there with them, who would actually pass this bill in the Assembly and in the Senate. So we know we could get it done. So it was important that we get it done quickly without a whole lot of brohaha, because we know as long as stuff stays on the stove, it gets hard, it gets ugly, and nobody wants to eat it. And so as a result, we needed to work fast to get this bill passed and signed by the governor. I also knew that California had the resources to accomplish it. California is the fifth largest economy, working to become the fourth largest economy in the world. So we have resources in California. In addition to that, we have an educational structure that is second to none. The institutions of learning in California in the post-secondary area are amazing. No one has a University of California system, a Cal State system, and an array of community colleges like California. So we have the brain power, the knowledge to, to basically do this if we choose to. And so I knew that 
So it's a place for us to be in California to raise this issue. Additionally, I recognize that if we could demonstrate, which we can and we have in this task force, that racism and slavery existed in California all the way from the Mason-Dixon lines and on the east coast of Virginia and North and South Carolina to come all the way across to the, to the California. It proves that this issue is systemic and it is across the nation. It's not just confined to slave states. That the damage is done across the nation. So I knew we could do it and I'm, I'm grateful for them doing it. You are going to have some robust conversations about those five issues that have been raised. I want to urge this task force to basically make sure that we do not lose sight of who the people are that we're trying to help, that we make sure the language is clear so that it doesn't become a free-for-all, that this is actually a harm issue. We know that in this state, race doesn't matter to them. We know that, that they're not going to deal with anything that deals with race. We've seen this recently in some legislation with regards to our kids getting money from schools and those kinds of things, and we've had to shape and redefine it's there. But they will deal with harm. If damage has been done, and it has been, it is their job to fix that damage. And this nation has done that over and over again with other groups. So we're fully aware of the fact that this is a harm issue. It is also an issue that many of you in this room won't benefit from. And we need to recognize that. Actually overcome some of the challenges faced. That doesn't mean we, we got equity or, or fairness in it, but we've learned to overcome the challenges that are there. And that's good, but we know that that group is small and has not necessarily impacted the economic issues of California, the educational issues, all those gaps that we look at. No matter how many black secretaries of state you have, that gap does not change. So we have to have something for the persons who are not in those categories as well, who have who've been able to buy homes and been able to overcome some of the racism, who have businesses and have prospered. We have to, we have to basically make sure that we're dealing with and focuses on those who have been the, the hardest hit in our community. And so I, I, I ask you honestly to really look hard at this task force, to look at the work that you've done, to push it forward, because if you don't push it forward, it loses its momentum. And you don't want to kill yourself by time. And I know it is always an attraction to stay in something longer than you need to. You know, but it's like a baby. If you don't, if you get, if you don't get it out, it's not going to live. And so I want you to basically do the best you can. Talk about what you need to get done. If you need something from me, let me know. But I want to make sure that the work gets done and the work continues. And that is extremely important. And this is one of the first steps because San Diego has turned out because they want to know what you're going to do. They want to impact it. And they're strong supporters of reparations. And we will need every supporter in California and beyond to pull this off to make sure that we make a difference. So as you're looking at your five things that you, will, that you have to answer about residency and so forth and so on, make sure that whatever your recommendations are will really change the experience and the life for African Americans in California. That is important. We don't need token things given to us that in the end, nobody knows what happened, nobody knows who got it, and we're still standing in the same hole we were in in, in 2022. So make sure that this, that your recommendations are going to have lasting impact, that it's going to be a change agent, that it's going to address the issues of the institutions that we face, because those are the challenges we face. Even when we have resources, we still face the structure and the institutions and the discriminatory practices in California. So I want to thank you for coming. Uh, my staff is here with me. Kip is here, and some, one of my other staff members is here. They flew in for this hearing. Um, I'll be in and around. I've got a bunch of meetings this morning, but I will be in and out, and I'll also probably get a chance to, <clears throat> to come back to the hearing that's here and tomorrow. And your assemblywoman will be here to represent me. Akila Weber will be in eventually sometime today for the hearing. But folks are listening, folks are watching. I want to thank you for your hard work. It has been a journey. And most folks wanted it to last longer than it is. But keep in mind, we have been working on the issue of reparations for a long time. This is not a new idea. But one good thing has come from all of this is that everywhere we go, people are taking up the issue, not waiting for Washington, 
developing programs that deal with housing and education. Even here in San Diego, our foundation is talking about how they can create more home ownership among African Americans in San Diego. So everyone has decided that reparations is their job, that they have to, if, they, if they're chair of something, an institution, they need to be addressing this issue because of what you've demonstrated in terms of the information that's there. So thank you so very much for all the research that's been done, all the work that's been done in writing the report and taking us to this point. We know there are many more places we need to do and a lot of more work that needs to be done. But we also recognize that I did uh, three years ago. I couldn't wait 40 more years. You know, I don't think I'll live to be 100 and what, 110. So, <laughs> you know, so as a result, I, we had to get it done now. Okay, thank you guys for coming. Welcome to San Diego. So good to see you all out of the little boxes my kids talk about on Zoom. Uh, it's, it's good to see you out of the little boxes and in your face it's here. And if I know some of you wanted to chat with me at some point. Uh, my staff is here. Make sure you get in touch with them. Uh, while you're here in San Diego, we'll try to figure out something. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you again, Secretary Weber, for those inspiring, welcoming remarks. Um, I'll next, I would like to acknowledge the city of San Diego Mayor, Todd Floria, if you all, if you had it in there. Uh, thank you, Chair Moore. Uh, let me tell you something. There's nothing I fear more in life than having to speak after Secretary Weber. You can see that we are so blessed and so fortunate to have Secretary Weber, not just in the role that she occupies, but her continued presence here in San Diego, which makes a difference. Uh, I would thank you, Dr. Weber, uh, for your long public service, for your great championship of just this issue, a host of issues, education primarily in my mind, uh, and we're so glad to see you in this role as our Secretary of State. I want to be here this morning to welcome uh, the commission to San Diego. Uh, we're proud to have you here in our great city. Uh, I want to give a special uh, welcome to my former colleagues, uh, Assembly Member Joan Sawyer and Senator Bradford. It's good to see you both. I miss you, uh, in, although I like seeing you better here in San Diego rather than Sacramento. Uh, and I wanted to be here to w offer welcome. That's often what a mayor is to, uh, d does. I get to do it many times a day. I'm glad that the weather is good. Uh, it makes that job a little bit easier. Uh, but obviously also to recognize the work of this commission. And I will tell you that as a former member of the legislature, I had the opportunity to vote for Dr. Weber's bill, which I gladly did. And <clears throat> thank you. And I will say that as a legislator and uh, Senator Bradford and uh, some of you remember uh, Joan Sawyer as well as our council president pro tem uh, can uh, attest to you vote for these things in hopes that folks will fill these positions and do the work and you are doing that work and I'm grateful that you are. Uh, this is an important issue. I don't have to tell you that you've been studying this for a long period of time, but from the very southern part of this state. As you cross all around it, it is important to us here in San Diego as well. And so I want to not just welcome you to San Diego, but to thank you for your service to your state. And on behalf of many people who are looking at this issue, craving strong, clear answers, real action, uh, we appreciate your willingness to do that work, recognizing that you're professionals whose time is extremely valuable and you're choosing to dedicate a considerable amount of that time to the benefit of your state, so thank you. I wanted to just share briefly, if I may, about what we're doing in San Diego. And I'll tell you that our efforts in, in this regard are really led by our council president pro tem, Monica Montgomery Stepp. And forgive me for the back to you all. You, you see me all the time. These folks, are, they're visitors. We want to put our best foot forward, right? We want to get some good recommendations. I, I want to say that under Council President Pro Tem's uh, leadership, the city has undertaken tremendous efforts to try and address inequities in our community. I think first and foremost was her idea for the creation of an Office of Race and Equity. It was her idea, as Mayor, it felt to me, to create it and to, to find staffing for it. And we're working together. It's changing things dramatically. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. In addition, she helped to lead a ballot measure that was overwhelmingly approved by San Diego voters to create an independent commission on review of police practices with subpoena power, with independent legal counsel to really have accountability uh, when, when bad things happen with regard to law enforcement. And of course, she continues to advocate for her district, our, the home of our African-American community here in San Diego, who has long borne the brunt of lack of investment, of disparity, of inequity, when she has risen to our pro tem uh, position on the city council 
you understand that how the power that has come from her diligence and her hard work is accruing to the benefit of a community that has long thought that City Hall didn't care about them, and we're working together to try and change that. My role as mayor is to try and take those ideas, the great ideas that come from the council president pro temp and the city council and make them real. And I want you to know, and I hope that in some way maybe this is illustrative of what the, the commission could consider. Uh, we and the city of San Diego are committed to equity. Our Office of Race and Equity is currently undertaking tactical equity plans for every city department. That means asking every department in our city, and there are dozens, Reggie, you know how cities work, that we have to look at everything that we do and ask ourselves, what is the disparity for San Diegans? All of those have now been quantified. Those are now being imbued into our current budget, which I'm working on today, that identifies where those gaps are and how to start funding to make the, make the, fill in those gaps. Uh, this is different. This, I will confess, is hard for city departments to really understand how an equ equity plays out with, say, infrastructure. But when you consider our city has roughly 3,000 miles of roads, and about 30 of them are unpaid, would you wonder where the 30 are unpaid? in our historically black and Latino communities. And so an equ equity does play a role in infrastructure and helping our city staff to understand that, start to program for it, and to start to solve it is transformational. Lastly, we've created a community equity fund, which I wanna actually share with members of the community since many of you are San Diegans. We will be soliciting community feedback for applications on how to use these dollars that we're trying to ask the community's partnership to address these inequities. So it's not just policy making, it's not just aspirational, uh, it's just about doing the real work of identifying the real problems and then devoting dollars to actually getting it done. My hope is that our city can lead on this issue. As the first person of color to elected to serve as the mayor of this city, as you understand, this is personal for me. I understand that growing up, uh, when I'd see my grandfather, who only ever wore a three-piece suit in his entire life, including when mowing the lawn of his, of the, of his yard here in San Diego, that was because he had to wear that suit in order to communicate that he was a man worthy of respect in this city. I recognize for many men and many women that continues to be a concern, that they don't see themselves as a full citizen of this community. My goal, working with the council president pro tem, is to change that. And we can't undo decades or centuries of disinvestment, of inequity, of injustice overnight, but I'm absolutely committed to work uh, with the council and with the community to do that, and your work is obviously critical to that. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you for your service to your state. Know that the second largest city in the state supports what you're doing, and we're here to be partners in making sure that the recommendations that you uh, put forward are acted upon. Uh, I'm absolutely here. My door is open to serve with you all in making sure that this gets completed. Thank you all again for your time this morning. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mayor Gloria, for those inspiring remarks. I'm teary-eyed as well. Thank you. That was very impactful. And I would also like to recognize um, Chris Ward, who is the Assembly Member for the 78th District. Hello. Would you like to make any remarks? Or <laughs> Reception. Well, thank you, and I also wanted to extend uh, good, a good morning and a welcome here to the San Diego region. We're at the interface of uh, the districts represented by myself and my great colleague, Dr. Akila Weber, and I want to have a special thank you again to our vice chair, my colleague, uh, Mr. Joan Sawyer, and Senator Bradford as well for coming down here, and I miss my colleague every day, uh, Council President Pro Tem Monica uh, Montgomery Stepp. Um, again, uh, Want to get to public comment because uh, that's why I'm here and my staff is here is to make sure that locally we're listening to the input that is so important here. Thank you for the work that you've done over the poor course of the past many months uh, to be able to lay the foundation. Um, but as my colleagues and I know, right now is the time to act. To reference back to what Secretary Weber was mentioning, we don't have time to wait and we of course have uh, bill deadlines coming up soon that we can begin to take some of these recommendations and the foundations uh, that you're laying into action this year. And so I'm excited to be a partner in that. You should clap for that. And whether we're working on our policy or our budget decisions that help us make sure that we're working on remediation, I know that we're not just addressing and importantly addressing the foundational work that was the establishment of this task force, but we're also intersecting with so many other issues of inequity that transcend all of our communities here that are important in California. And so your work is going to go beyond just that core foundation. Your work is going to really be pivotal to be able to help so many Californians that have been affected by the injustices, by the inequity 
inequities that we see in our educational systems, in our housing systems, in our economic opportunities, this is going to be groundbreaking. And so I'm grateful for the work that you're doing, and my staff and I are excited to be able to listen uh, here today to San Diego's input as we consider exactly how we're going to work on some of those re uh, remediation efforts. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Assemblymember Ward. Thank you again, Mayor Gloria, and thank you again, Secretary Weber. So the next item on the agenda is public comment. It's a great turnout, and so I want to get some feedback from uh, the task force. Uh, we want to honor the folks who are here in person, so how about we do 40 minutes of public comment in person, uh, 20 minutes of public comment on the phone lines, and each person gets two minutes each. All right, so... Public comment has officially started. It is 9.30. Uh, Ms. Aisha Martin-Walton will assist in that effort. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Aisha Martin-Walton. I'm with the California Department of Justice, and I'd like to welcome the task force, the public, and folks on the call. The task force would like to hear from you. Your public comments are very important. As you, uh, the chair indicated, you will have two minutes today to speak. And please be advised that you may be politely interrupted and notified when your two minutes is up. Uh, but however, please know that you can always attend any of the reparations meetings in person or on the call. Uh, we have several more before the years is before the uh, project is ends. Also, you can always submit written comments to the task force at reparations at taskforce at doj.ca.gov. So let us begin. First commenter, please. Greetings, greetings. Uh, thank you guys for your work, though. I appreciate it. CJEC, uh, Chris, thank you for the information. Uh, as I went back and I saw that assembly, uh, Reginald Sawyer Jones said that something about we have two jails that was shut down, that was closed. As I look over the five things we need is rehabilitation. Well, that's one of the five. There's no way that we are getting rehabilitated in these jails today. And I, I heard you guys say, oh, well, let's, you know, train them better. No, 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 no. We got 100 million acres of land here. The government owned 45 and a half million acres of land. A jail is only 300 acres of land. Now, if you guys want to be serious about reparations, let the last go first on this one, Pastor. We need to look out. For, I lost one brother in 2011 in the penitentiary. He died from a staph infection. Four years ago, my brother, older than me, another older brother, got sentenced to 27 to life for a manslaughter, which only carries up to 11 years. They're still doing the George Jacksons today. Solidad, brother. Let's stop this. Let's get this land and put our prisons. We want those two prisons. We want our own staff there. We want Judge Joe Brown, Judge Matthews, or whoever to be there to give our people the right judgment on before they get out of jail. We got resources up the yang yang. We can't let them keep trying to experiment with us. We know what it takes. We got agape love for our people. No more Philadelphia brother love. We want agape. Only way we're going to get it is from our own people. Because they're going to care about every single inmate. Three black people die every day in the prisons in the United States. 3.21 to be exact. So every time you eat breakfast, pray for one. Every time you eat lunch, pray for one. Every time you eat dinner, pray for one. And when you eat your snack, pray, get ready for the next one. So that's all I ask that you guys can consider. This 40 acres in the mule that we was promised a long time ago, let's stick with that. All right, I'm going to talk real fast. I am Friday Jones. My name is Consul Jones Muhammad. I'm the president of the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants, former co-chair of Los Angeles chapter, founding member of CJEC, vice president for the Los Angeles Reparations Task Force, appointed by Mayor Garcetti. Today, I'm talking as an individual. We are the grassroots of this California movement. Before we were organizations, we were people with a common history picking up the torch of our ancestors and living relatives to further the deliverance of reparations to descendants of persons freed through the emancipation under the U.S. Constitution. There are people that would diminish our collective works, 
We are the people that work with Dr. Weber to add language to AB 3121 when it was a bill proposal. We are the people that championed the bill through the State Assembly and Senate. We are the people that organized prominent individuals to call Gavin Newsom and push him to sign the bill. Nationally, we are the people that submitted H.R. 40's uh, edits to Sheila Jackson Lee and the Judiciary Commission. We are the uh, people that requested a presidential executive order for reparations um, in August of 2021 with our landmark Repair Act presidential priorities demanding additional policy like reestablishing the Freedmen's Bureau. We asked for ASL to be at the very first hearing and it took someone to show up at the December hearing with a disability and there is no evidence still that ASL interpreters have been made a permanent part of these hearings. ASL is uh, culturally relevant and you all basically missed an opportunity to introduce people to black American sign language which was born out of uh, structural racism and which became a necessity. Um, I was supposed to read a poem today from inmate Lester Polk. However, I didn't receive the poem in time and will email it, but inmates do not have access to these hearings. There has been no effort to provide inmates with an email or physical mailing address to provide public comment to this body. Inmates cannot access state websites. There must be accommodations made in both of these spaces. Thank you for your work. The critics that misrepresent our work, thank you, because you make us work better. Thank you. We have two minutes. Thank you to all. I was cut short before, unfortunately. And so the thing is, I really appreciate every member here. You're an esteemed group, and I wanted to say more about that. But anyway, let me move forward. I want to speak to what's on the agenda today, but uh, damages, okay? Real quick, damages, certainly they have to go back to slavery. We're talking about compensation back to slavery. What are California's residency requirements? There should be no resident requirements for Californians. We have to encourage our people to come back to California. What better way to encourage our people to come back to California if we have no requirements? Okay, now, what determines the beginning of harm? Uh, you know, back to slavery. Uh, will direct victims of slavery in California descendants uh, receive compensation? That's what we're talking about, certainly. How will uh, reparations be paid immediately? <laughs> and, and, and all damages. Uh, I've got some thoughts on that. I've, uh, I'm Reverend Tony Pierce. Uh, I'm the CEO of Black Wall Street Project. We're a global organization. We have offices in Canada. Mexico, all over the world. And so we're all in this fight with you. How will reparations be paid? Let me say something real quick. I did a little work with the people, if, and I want to give Pastor, you advice. I'm so sorry, your time okay. is up. I'm, However, feel free to come back tomorrow I'll or. Be back. Okay, wonderful. And 200,000 <laughs> is not enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Abdul Rahim Hamid. Senator Bradford, it's good to see you and my beloved sister, Monica Montgomery. I'm the national president of the Black Contractors Association of USA, Inc., with 17 chapters in five states. Our work is to fight for equity and inclusion for African Americans who are being disenfranchised from construction unions and construction industry as a whole. To that fact, we have established our first and only African American federal approved apprenticeship program, which is a mandate. You have to hire one apprentice to every five journeymen. And that apprenticeship program is very important because unlike the $200,000 payoffs, we're talking about training African Americans to make $100,000 a year. 
And we have documentation. This has been going on for 40 years. But unbeknownst to you, you are outlawing us and redlining us with your project labor agreements that exclude the Black Contractors Association from public contracting, which is a mandate. Secretary, former Secretary Alexis, I mean, pardon me, uh, Hilda Solis, as I spoke to her in Los Angeles at the County Board of Supervisors, and she nodded and agreed that she was the first one to approve the American, the first African American federal approved apprenticeship program in the country. So it's not about just a payoff that we're going to squander off in two to three years with the Mercedes Benz and the come ups, but it's about perpetual economic opportunities by training and leveling the playing fields. We need our own damn program and we need to protect it because this is the, the last uh, part of me. This is like burning down Wall Street and other things that we had. If we had the 140 towns that we had built at one time, we wouldn't be asking for reparations. We'll be some of the richest people in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. And commenters, please speak into the mic. Great. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chantal Chichati Bacon. Um, I am a descendant of the uh, U.S. Freedmen. Uh, my lineage goes back to 1790, um, present day um, Alabama. Um, so when I say that we are foundation to this uh, country, we go back, way back. Um, but I am here because of my two paternal grandparents who have recently transitioned. One was a, um, an educator with the um, um, Pasadena Unified School District for over 40 years. She uh, came from Blackwater, Alabama, which is probably, you can't find it on a map today. <laughs> but um, because of her, I can. I'm also a descendant of Lily Mae Ward, who recently passed. She, she is daughter of a um, sharecropper. And because of them, I stand here and my daughter stands here. I wanna talk about the interim report on housing, segregation, um, education, and medical. The language, when you speak of terms such as BIPOC, disadvantaged community, low-income community, community of color, historically red line community, again, we need to be specific in who we're talking to. Uh, we are not, we have to, when you do those research, I want you guys to ask, who are these people you're talking about? Because a lot of those people are no longer in those communities. They have moved out because of the disenfranchisement towards specifically their nation of, their nation of origin, their, uh, their previous con condition of servitude, them being linked to the U.S. Freedmen descendants. So I just want to get really clear on that language. We are not just to be lumped in. I see that. When you talk about in the report, it talks about black and it talks about Latin. Again, this is about us. This is not about anybody else. So please get that language right when you're talking about that. To those who think that they do not deserve reparations because they're doing well, again, this is something that is owed to you. You overcame. My, my grandparents overcame the harms. And um, thank you so much. Oh, no, no, that's okay. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks for your comments this morning. Next speaker, please speak into the mic. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ishmael Bartley. I am a descendant of people enslaved formerly in central Georgia and along the southeastern coast of Georgia. My team is currently working under the name The Bartley Group, and our primary function is that of a think tank organized around contributing to the reparations effort. On December 15th, we sent a summary describing the Freedman Protocol to mitigate implicit bias in health care, or the FPIBH, to Dr. Grills. Uh, Implicit bias, as we all know, is, is a, a, subconscious, uh, a subconscious response, uh, and it, it, it surfaces in, in professional settings. It is an ingredient that flavors, energizes, and furthers the racial health gap. Given the nature of implicit bias, an auditable protocol is needed to provide proof that competent, bias-free, and sufficient care was or was not administered. Uh, the FPIBH is that protocol. The FPIBH involves all of the actors who participate in the state health care system, from the, from the Department of Insurance to the payers. Payers are insurance companies, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Kaiser, and to the providers, hospitals, doctors, and nurses. Uh, the, the, this protocol should begin with a set of steps that begins with the identification, proceeds through diagnosis, supports the care paradigm in question, and ensures that the highest and best available course of treatment was enacted for the freedmen in question. In short, what we want is for providers, 
we, we, want, we want to define a compact set of actions that healthcare providers must take when they, when they contact a person who is identified as a freedman. Second, we want a codified EDI claim that can be sent along with the claim for the encounter with the freedman. When you go to the doctor, uh, as soon as you walk into the emergency room, there's a claim that's, that's created. That claim is an electronic document that is then sent to the insurance company. The insurance company uses that claim to pay, to pay the hospital in question. What we, want to do, what we want the Department of Insurance to do is issue a rule codifying a requirement with language that payers cannot pay providers unless there is evidence of this protocol that has been produced. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> uh, hopefully, uh, I can get a response to the email that I sent to Dr. Grills. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your important comments this morning. Next speaker. Good morning, Task Force members, members of the DOJ. It is wonderful to see you all again, as Dr. Weber said, outside of the little boxes that I normally see you in, and always good to see you all together doing this important work. My name is Chad Brown. I'm with the NAASD in Los Angeles, National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants. I'm also with Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, a statewide coalition that has been working and advocating around reparations for the past four years. I would like to start my comments by first invoking two names into this session. Those two names are Keenan Anderson and Tyree Nichols, both black American freedmen men murdered indiscriminately in, in the month of January. Make no mistake, the work you do here today is directly connected to ending the genocide that is being perpetrated on us across this country for centuries. Next, I'd like to say a big thank you to all members of this task force for affirming lineage as the standard that you will use to craft reparations proposals. Thank you, Dr. Jovan Scott Lewis, for making that motion. And thank you, Councilmember Montgomery Stepp, for seconding that motion. And to all task force members that voted into an affirmative, thank you. That was the correct decision that shows that you see us. It shows that you recognize our personhood. And it also shows that this task force has a willingness to be bold. As you know, in my comments in February, in my testimony to this task force, and in my public comments, I've always called on you to be bold. I will make that same call on you today, specifically to the two legislators on a task force, Assembly Member Reginald Jones Sawyer, Senator Bradford. You heard from the mayor of San Diego today that we should not wait. We should have legislation moving today that sets the foundation for the reparations proposals that are to come in June of this year. In the preliminary report, you have a recommendation for a California Office of Freedmen Affairs. There is no reason why we cannot write that legislation today, establish that office so that it is in place to implement the reparations proposals that you will approve at the end of this task force. Thank My you. time is up, Aisha. Thank you for always keeping us right and exact. <laughs> I'll move on and thank you. I'll look thank forward you. to thank your Thank you, meeting. Mr. Brown. <laughs> okay. You can adjust the mic. There you go. Good morning, Chair Moore, Vice Chair Brown, Task Force members. My name is Marcus Champion. I'm a member of CJAC, NAASD. I'm a California resident. I'm from Inglewood, and I live in South Central. Again, I want to encourage Senator Bradford and Member Joan Sawyer to start pulling from submitted proposals and have legislation crafted that can start to move in this session. The most important being the institution of the Office of American Freedmen Affairs. This office will handle eligibility. This office is also vital for the long-term implementation of rep reparations policy in the state of California. The task force is almost over, but we are just getting started. Let's get the policy moving. American freedmen deserve bold policy and to be made whole. Direct cash payments, tax exempt status, free college education, grants for home ownership, business grants, access to low to no interest business capital and funding, access to low to no interest home loans, protected class status similar to that of Native, Native Americans, and many, many other policy solutions. I also want to bring attention to the role of communications. The Daily Mail has published multiple articles of misinformation on the task force. Fox News has now begun to put out misinformation with Tucker Carlson misrepresenting the work done so far as the intent and purpose of the task force. He also sent out dog whistles to uninformed, low information racists who want, just, want justice denied. We need the communications firms uh, ready to proactively dispel misinformation and ensure the task force is at all times properly represented. 
To my family, my fellow African-American descendants of persons enslaved in the United States, we are the generation to conclude this rep reparations journey. Our children's children and beyond will know a much different world. When it comes to justice, when it comes to reparations, we can't be stopped. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Champion. Next speaker, please. Hello, good morning, everybody. Greetings to San Diego. My name is Ralph Johnson. Uh, I'd just like to run by a couple of things real quick. First, uh, to the task force, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're doing a monumentous job. Uh, a lot of people are trying to kind of, you know, make it not seem like it's so important. I'm not a history buff, but I, for my little research, this is about the closest thing to reconstruction, you know. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, thanks. Uh, Y'all doing a great job. Also to uh, Governor Newsom, uh, Attorney General Vonta, and um, the Honorable, and last but not least, uh, the catalyst of this movement, the Honorable Dr. Shirley Weber. Um, she's, she's on top of it, y'all. Uh, a quick uh, background on my family. I'm the number seven of eight children we're all born here in California. Um, my mom and dad are both from Texas. Soon after my dad uh, served in World War II, he was also a Buffalo soldier. Uh, they met and they met, married, and settled here in California. Uh, one last thing. Uh, in closing, uh, as we head to the uh, uh, to the final stretch of all of this, uh, everyone who's in support of what we're doing here in California. Uh, stay focused, be prepared for the pushback, the distractions, the negative energy, uh, because it's coming, y'all. It's coming, it's coming. So just stay focused, just stay focused. Uh, we could be our own lobby for equal rights and justice uh, because a debt is old. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, the committee. It's an honor having you here in San Diego. I followed all your meetings over the years, and specifically the information that you've you've had. You've done some heavy, heavy lifting. And I want to acknowledge Representative Sawyer and. Council Pro Tem Montgomery. I'm, my name is Jerry Moss, and I'm a member of the San Diego African Americans Genealogy Research Group. And we conduct research, and that's what my goal is. And we had a outreach program at the San Diego Downtown Library, and we had a lot of people who participated. Our goal is to help people find their families, and also Build their family trees. How many? How many of you? How many of you have taken the DNA test? How many of you want to? How many? Of you, how many of you know your four? Grandparents, your four grandparents. It's important that we find out our history, and one of the ways to do that is with DNA. So gather information from your family members, and there's a family history library by the Latter Day Saints down in San Diego, in Mission Valley. They help you. And our organization helps also. Along with Jaime, my partner Wendell Stimmy, thank you, thank you very much. One of the wonders of the world is DNA. It's connecting thank our families. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for those very important comments. Next speaker, welcome. Uh, good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank you for all the work you're doing uh, on this task force. I'm Dr. Charles Toombs. I am president of the California Faculty Association, professor of Africana Studies at San Diego State University. 
I want to speak to what's happening in the California State University system. We have unabated and relentless anti-black racism. Uh, CFA has been working. We've had an initial meeting with the California uh, Legislative Black Caucus uh, on ideas, legislation uh, that can address that. A couple of ideas I would like uh, this task force to consider is free tuition for black students in the CSU, uh, also uh, resourcing black uh, resource centers and developing them on our campuses, also doing something to address the uh, retention, recruitment, and promotion uh, on our campuses of black faculty. Many of our black faculty are leaving uh, the system because it is just not working for them. We have done a lot in CFA to address policing on our campuses, and we're still uh, pursuing that. So in a nutshell, the California Faculty Association is certainly willing and able and committed to working with the task force in any way that we can uh, to uh, address the anti-black racism in the CSU. We also think that uh, our campuses should be designated as black-serving institutions with all of the resources that would be a part of that. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Next speaker. Greetings, Chair Brown. I mean, <laughs> Chair Moore, Vice Chair Brown, and members of the task force. My name is Dimlis Johnson III, and I am speaking on behalf of Black Californians United for Early Care and Education, also known as Black ECE. As a result of historically deficit-minded policies, the ECE system is steeped in anti-black beliefs and practices, thus reproducing racialized harm. We aim to ensure California's ECE system is culturally affirming for black children, families, and early educators, and the ECE policies and resource allocations are aligned with Max such vision. Full interim report does not explicitly call out the distinct experiences of anti-blackness in, ch in black children, families, and child care providers in California's early education system um, have historically endured. Black ECE's 10-point plan uplifts the necessity and demand for a specific and tailored approach to fully invest in the black whole child, whole family, whole ECE workforce, and whole community approach. California's early education system is at a critical inflection point that is on the brink of further oppression of black children, families, and child care providers. And given the historical context of black women being the nation's first caregivers, it is imperative that the task force includes a recommendation that elevates the child care and early education system. Black ECE will be formally submitting a letter to the California Reparations Task Force in February to consider adding early education into the California Reparations Report. In the meantime, please feel free to visit our website, blackece.org. Once again, that is blackece.org. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Every other city I go, I see the same organizations. I don't see black Americans at all. Um, where are the communications to the black Americans? We haven't seen any billboards, any commercials about reparations for two years. It's the same people in these meetings. And the same people in these meetings also said that they put in legislation that black Americans don't know about, okay? American Freedmen, Black American Freedmen, which one is it? Uh, everyone doesn't approve. So the grassroots of for Black Americans will be doing surveys for Black Americans because nobody knows. Um, my parents, my family don't know. Uh, people around me don't know. People at church don't know. And I am a Black Californian. And people outside of California are making legislation for me. And I don't like it. I am from L.A. I was born in San Diego um, at Balboa Naval Medical Center. So I think I have a, a claim here as well. I'm a black American. Uh, my father was in the Navy. My lineage uh, fought in every American war. My forefathers on my mother's side came from Georgia, like Biddy Mason. She was dark, but she was classified as mulatto. So we need to get the reclassifications and orders as well, because later on she was reclassified as what? Negro. It's not in the internal reports about reclassification. It needs to be omitted. 
uh, chapter 1, page 40, um, on section 7, terms through, uh, throughout, used throughout the report, whoever speaks on the importance of terms. And since I said all black Americans are not African, I've been met with criticism called pretendian, and that's a derogatory and racial slur. And people, again, all black Americans are not from Africa, um, but I did not negate that black Americans um, did not descend from Africa. So um, I've been met with harassment um, and where, where is the communication funds going? I heard it was $1.5 million. It's been two years. Again, it's not a known thing. Where's the billboards? Where's the communication? And I'd just like to say, um, we need to make sure these el eligibility uh, statuses is, is correct for everyone that are um, eligible for reparations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for your comments this morning and coming out. Uh, just a quick check in, excuse me, one moment, Speaker, uh, Chair Moore. It's uh, 10 o'clock. We've got 10 minutes remaining. So our next speaker. Good morning, Task Force members. Um, my name is Josiah Williams. I'm with the American Redress Coalition of California Bay Area and the Coalition for Just and Equitable California. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you for basically being in line with Dr. Weber's intent um, to have the lineage, uh, lineage of descendants of U.S. chattel slavery as the, the horned party in, in regard to reparations. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to add that, you know, if there is anyone else that has their own claim, they can definitely write it up, you know, get someone to champion it, and, you know, I, I you know, will, you know, support them in that, in that effort. But this is for a specific group of people. Um, second, um, we, we don't have to wait. We heard it multiple times. We don't have to wait. You know, we know some of the proposals that's being made. And we want to also ensure that it's aligned with the intent. We don't want people of color, BIPOC, and everything else included in the proposed legislation that comes out of this task force. And lastly, we heard a lot about the communications. Um, there's not very much of it, you know, and there's a lot of miscommunication and misinformation that needs to be combated a lot better. So we ask that the communication firms can do you know, a little more efforts into, the, into that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Chair Moore. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lakeisha Milner. I'm from Los Angeles. And I'm here because I hurt. And I want to know how to heal through this chattel slavery. From years of just looking at my parents growing up here, my father working in World War II, they sending money back home to pay for their their wood cabin that they lived in, and the money not getting to the government, so someone took their home, or their log cabin, where 12 of them grew up in, and a one-bedroom log cabin. How, how do I heal from that? You know, my daughter is at school, and she's able to say her grandfather fought in World War II. How do we heal from that? So it's a thing called post-traumatic slave syndrome that Dr. Joy DeGruy talked about. It's her theory. And with me traveling to Africa several times, going into the slave castles, going into to, to Ghana and Senegal, looking at these things, and then working in a place where I'm in a, in, 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 covered. I don't like being covered in. I like to see windows, which they didn't have in the slave castles. So when I'm in there, I, I feel now that I've been to the slave castles, I hurt. How do I heal? Those of you who are psychologists on the, on the, on the, the panel, there is a healing for people who have post-traumatic disorders. Having post-traumatic slave syndrome, there are four things, four or five things in there where you heal from. If you read the book for Dr. Joyce DeGruy, she'll let you know her theory, and it, it's amazing. Thank you. We're going to pause um, public comment, pause. Chair Moore. Yes, so we started public comment at 930, mm -hmm. so we still have some time until 1030 to go, so it's 10.04. Um, so we, you know, whoever's in line will just stick with that, and in the last 15 minutes or so, we will uh, go to the phone lines. So, okay. Go ahead. All right. Continue. Next thank speaker. you. I was a little nervous. Like, why did they get to me and cut it off? Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> thank you. And I want to um, recognize Miss um, uh, Councilwoman uh, Monica Montgomery Step, who is um, representing our San Diego area. But my name is Jacqueline Clark. 
and i don't i live in lemon grove and i have not been a california resident so i already know that i don't qualify for reparations however since the task force is making recommendations to the federal government and people are watching other states are watching i just want to add my couple of five cents to this i want to speak to eligibility and to add rob to the um, robust conversation of how and who qualify for reparations. I'll start out with saying, in your re recommendations, it would be an oversight not to recommend amending HR 4238, which amended two federal acts from the 70s that define minorities with the terms that were considered insensitive or outdated at that time. And Negro was included in that. The Department of Energy Organization Act and the Local Public Works Capital Development and Investment Act of 1976 were those two acts. And to two of Dr. Weber's points, be certain that language is clear and everyone won't qualify. But making sure that those who are entitled have a clear path to qualify. William A. Darity Jr., an American economist and social sciences researcher and professor of public policy and author of From Here to Equality, reparations for black Americans in the 21st century is quoted as saying, we propose that there are two criteria for eligibility. The first is what we refer to as a lineage standard. An individual would have to demonstrate that they have at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. And then the second is an identity standard. An individual would have to demonstrate that for at least 12 years before the enactment of a reparations program, the individual would have had to self-identify as black, Negro, or African-American. It is Negro that I'd like to focus on. Excuse me, I am so sorry to cut you off in the middle of your sentence, but your time is up. Thank you. But feel free to come back tomorrow. I certainly will. Oh, perfect. All right, thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon to all of you all. My name is Bishop Henry Williams, okay? And uh, I am a 88-year-old slave from Leesburg, Florida. They put me in slavery at picking oranges when I was a youngster. And God blessed me to escape. But there was a lot of many bodies, over 20 young black, was buried there for trying to escape. Shot down the door, bad shot gun. And I'm also asking help from that to number one, to be able to go back there and dig up them bodies. I promised a lot of the mothers and fathers when I got back to Dothan, Alabama, that I would get some people to come back there. Over the years, I turned this into the FBI's, news people and everything. Nobody did anything, okay? But if I get the money, I would pay to go back there and take people back there to dig up them bodies and everything back there. About 20 or more young black men buried on each side of the road going in. And I'm also here to speak on the Freeman Bureau. This is money that's owed to black peoples. Just as the Emancipation Proclamation, okay? And I, I want to say something here. This, this is something here that people should look at. For, I've been in this for 40 years, 50 years actually, researching, investigating reparation. And whether you all know it or not, there was a black hero, a cousin of mine, picked up a rabbit and everything when I was out in the field, cotton field, five years old. He said, you want a rabbit? I said, yeah, he out run the rabbit, caught a rabbit, and tied a string on the rabbit leg, brought him back and gave him to me. I have memories of that. Thank you, Bishop. I'm so sorry to, to cut your time off, but um, the task force really appreciates your comments, and thank you so much for coming out today.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just be brief. Um, so Bishop Williams is uh, a director for the Kingdom Warriors Foundation, so it's very serious that we take heed, especially to our elders who are speaking truth to power to make it, make it so. So my name is uh, Dr. Truth Bay, um, actually Hip Hop Fraternity, as well as NBPP. I, I speak on behalf of uh, Bishop Williams, the repeal of SB 960. I wanna know who passed it, why wasn't it told? Senate Bill 960 was passed on October 2022, 20, and it states that non-citizens can come and become law enforcement officers. Did anybody know that? Why is that possible? How we not see what happened with Tyree? We also see Lavelle Lane, a young man from Spartanburg, South Carolina, that was killed in the detention center. So your policing section that you stated was in page 374 is actually page 375 in your own interim report. So if we have to get the page number correct on policing and have legislation to cover an anti-black hate crime bill, yes, these are the things that need to happen. The Freedmen's Bureau is the center of all of that. Under the current law, we need, to change these, we need to change these regulations. What we want to see primarily is the, the division within each other, within groups, for us to come here and speak on legislation. If we're not about legislation and understand that there is nothing protecting us, there's nothing protecting us from policing, especially when you now have Senate Bill 960, where you don't even have to speak English to police me. So these are the five million dollars of reparations that San Francisco has done. That's what we should follow suit. Start with five million dollars for every qualified chattel slave descendant. And as we move forward, February 20th needs to be a nationwide caravan march for justice. That worked in the 60s and it can work today. Our young people need to have a backbone and know that we have to be out in these streets and have legislation to really change laws. So as we close to these reparations, thank you. thank you, reparations hearing, I do hope that we actually have legislation, as they say today, as of now, it's too late. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out so, today. To remain consistent, uh, we will off in-person comment and go to the virtual phone lines at this time. We have about a dozen people on the line, and we weren't able to get to them at our Oakland hearing. So to remain consistent, we will go to the virtual lines now. And I encourage you all who weren't able to give in-person comment uh, today to come back tomorrow. Thank you so much. Okay. Don? Good morning, Don. This is Aisha. Yes. Hi. And when we can Donna, take inventory, a, a staff Please. member can take inventory as to who what wasn't able to speak, and you can put your name on the list for tomorrow. Great idea. Um, Don, okay, we're ready for our first speaker, please. First line. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press 1, then 0 on your telephone keypad. First, we go on to the line 36. Please go ahead. May I? Good morning. Yes, we can hear May you. May I speak? May I speak? Please. Thank you. Hello, and to everyone. I would like to mention that in reference to reparation, it's a very simple solution I have. If the Black Americans in California can produce a birth certificate that has Black or Negro on it, that should be sufficient. I called Louisiana and talked to someone regarding the 1870 census. It's not as reliable based on my, my observation, and it's not really, it would be difficult for individuals to, to in other words, people could have been missed, names misspelled, and I'm thinking that with this information should arrest and attention of anybody. So this reparation issue doesn't have to be a confusing, how shall I say, long-term situation. 
the governor, I'd recommend that he tell everybody in California, if you have a birth certificate with black or, or what is it, Negro on it, that's all we need. We'll, we'll have to make arrangements for checks or whatever to address this reparation in California. In closing, Happy New Year. You're two beautiful thoughts for everybody. Thus saith the Lord, and I quote, Wherefore well, for he saith, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Thank you, and may the Lord bless all of you today. Thank you. Don, next, next caller, please. Next, we're going to line number 11. Please go ahead. This is Angela Nirvana. Back to the Newsweek article dated 12-8-22 when I was cut off last uh, hearing, before last. American freedmen should automatically be deemed eligible without having to go through exhaustive genealogical study and analysis. The only proof that should be required is a birth certificate from your line with Negro or colored on it. All American freedmen in the state of California and those who've been legislated out of California since Newsom signed AB 3121 should be eligible. We've been legislated down from roughly 7 to 2 million in the state. We should receive cash, an anti-black hate crime bill, and put an end to state-sanctioned executions of our unarmed black men, women, and children. No more programs that you give with the left and give away with the right like affirmative action. I am really over how everyone uses our never-ending holocaust for their come up while we are being extincted. There should be a moratorium on legal immigration. These illegals should be returned to their countries and the borders should be closed. You know like how the U.S. is protecting Ukraine borders with our reparations until American freedmen have been repaired and made American. And the gate surrounding lineage should be that you've identified as black or African American in the last two census. With that being said, immigrants being able to flourish in this country is your reparations. My ancestors made that possible. Try being grateful over demanding what you're not owed. And white folks raping, killing, imprisoning, and stealing from American freedmen, and then being designated white is clearly your reparations. Rest in power, Shirley Huzar of Urban Game Changers, who gave her life to social justice and economic inclusion for American freedmen. This one's for you. Thank you for allowing me to share. That's my time. I'll Thank you. There. Next mic, please. Next, we're going to line number 21. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Mimi Velasquez. I am of dual lineage. Uh, I have a uh, grandparents that are from Louisiana. And then I also have a grandparent from Haiti and another from Puerto Rico. Uh, I am calling because being that the, the, the committee did rule on lineage, I am glad that that has happened because simply going off of a birth certificate that says Negro or colored or, you know, the various different rations that they use um, is not enough because that allows anyone in. Um, and then you also have the issue in regards to African Americans that were very, very light skinned as my father was who basically was deemed a white boy in childhood and then was finally a Negro when he walked into a Long Beach hospital with my pregnant mother. So you have that, um, you, you have that, um, whatever you call it, um, that discrepancy, but it needs to be based on lineage. You need to be able to trace your ancestry to someone that was um, enslaved by this country or its colonies. Um, letting just any birth certificate allowed in regards to, again, saying Negro or colored is going to allow anyone in, and they might, might not necessarily be a descendant of someone enslaved in this country. Um, you know, they could be a descendant of someone enslaved in Haiti, a descendant of someone enslaved in Puerto Rico. They can be a descendant of someone enslaved in the Bahamas. They, this this um, task force was, according to what I read in the text, was for Americans specifically that were descendants of people enslaved in this country. So if we are just allowing a Negro or black birth certificate, that is going to open it up for scrutiny. Um, and the, you know, the purpose of the law is to be right and exact. And that also lets off the other countries that participated in that heinous crime. So they need to pay their part too to the people, to the descendants of the people they enslaved. And I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, next line, Don, please. Thank 
you. And next, we're going to line number 18. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Nell Jensen. I am a retired teacher, and I'd like to commend and thank the panel for their efforts. I am Caucasian, and I am for reparations for descendants of slaves. Um, I want to address the uh, where the money is coming from in order to make the reparations. <clears throat> Slave owners were Democrats. Southern Democrats formed the KKK. Jim Crow laws were enacted by Southern Democrats. The 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, was not voted on by the Democrats. The Democrats were opposed to the 14th Amendment, which entitled slaves citizenship. Democrats were opposed to the 15th Amendment, which gave them the right to vote. And even to this day, Democrats oppose school choice, which trapped black students in failed public schools. My point, if reparations are to be made, and I, I'm glad that you are talking about this, and I think they should be made, they should be made by Democrats only. Those are the people who um, were the people who were against blacks, and they continue to be this day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments this morning. Don, next line, please. Thank you. And next, we're going to line number 28 down so we can Sorry, hear from the rest of the watched. public via the virtual line. Thank you. Don, next uh, line, We're going to please. go to line number, line number 37. Perfect. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hey, O.P., this is Cash Gaines, Cash with a K. I'm Black American on both sides of the context of the conversation. I want to say, uh, as everyone else is, I didn't think I have to say thank you for the language standard, but people still calling in, trying to make it confusing. Uh, I wanted to uplift the San Francisco, uh, California, excuse me, Reparations Task Force, which mentioned that five million lump sum. Because uh, we were talking about lump sums for a while amongst our reparations community. Uh, for those who don't trust the government to have long-term strategies, as well for our OGs who, uh, you know, don't necessarily receive a lot of benefits from just a lifetime payment. Um, I wanted to also uplift San Francisco mentioning 250 years of payments uh, tied to the area of median income. I think it should be double that, and I think it should be double 250 years, maybe 500, 400, or maybe that would be the federal argument. Uh, debt forgiveness and tax credits are also a part of the San Francisco reparations. I'm just trying to call in to say, at this point, SF's kind of ahead of the curve. I think we should use their numbers as well as the recommendations of this entire task force. I don't know if that means San Francisco gets $5 million or San Francisco residents are going to get 10 But, yeah, obviously every California resident just looking at what San Francisco survivors owed, a $5 million lump sum, as well as 250 years of payments. And again, that should be 400 or more. Um, and I wanted to shout out the San Francisco Task Force for mentioning the Freedmen's Bank. Uh, that's something that I think is very in tandem with the California uh, African American Freedmen Affairs Agency that's suggested by this task force. So I just wanted to applaud you, especially uh, uh, Dr. Amos Brown, with that at your mic. All right, thank you. Thanks for your comments this morning. Don, next, uh, next line, please. Next, we're going to line number 22. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, <clears throat> my name is Kari Haynes. I'm from the Bay Area, California. This is my first time ever experiencing this opportunity in my lifetime. Uh, I have four uh, ancestors, or great great that uh, were enslaved and two uh, or both sides of my family uh, slave owners um, are also in my DNA. Um, my thing, my first question is when it comes to the reparation and the, the disbursement of reparation, is that just by per family or per individual uh, of each family? Because I understand that we also, I am also concerned when it comes to our family um, receiving this reparation, people would take it differently uh, based on generation. Um, so just keeping that in mind, how this money will be dispersed, we also have to be aware of what can potentially happen within our family unit uh, if we are not clear on how the reparations will be dispersed. 
generationally. Other than that, thank you, task force and people on the panel. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for representing us as SBA foundationally black Americans, just to be specific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Don, next line. Are we allowed to go back to this line number that's already spoken? No, please proceed to the next caller. There are no more line numbers except for a repeat. Okay, yes, please. Yes. Going back to line number 28, please go ahead. Hello? Yes, my name is Levon Stone. I'm the executive director of the Fort Ord Environmental Justice Network. I have been talking about reparations forever. I applied to be a member of the task force. I have traveled around this country for the black community because the gentrification that has been going on in California is unbelievable. My husband is a veteran, a disabled veteran. We are still being treated as though we are slaves right now. I was a county commissioner for 11 years. I never got a dime. I represented the low-income disadvantaged community, which we are still doing. We have no funds. There was no COVID money. There was nothing. Now, for anybody to say that it's all right to be treated that way, we know that there is a reason why we're treated that way. And for the task force or anybody else in this state to deny a black person reparations when it was already decided years and years ago and it was turned up, why is it that this continues? This is not right. There is no justice here. And the Justice Department and everybody else needs to get on board here and make sure it's done. If my birth certificate says I'm black or Negro or whatever it is, that should be sufficient unless you're going to supply the money for anything else that you want. The Japanese, the American Indians, the Filipinos, all those people got reparations. Nobody did any of that stuff. And for you to keep on trying to put us in the back of the bus and treat us like we are not human beings, we're not Americans, and our ancestors were forced to come here, give me a ticket and put me on a ship and ship me back to Africa somewhere where I can have land to do what I need to do and have a community because we have none here. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that's our last caller on the line. So thank you, everyone. It is uh, 1027, Chair Moore. I will close public comments. Okay. Thank you, members of the public, uh, for public comment, those who gave public comment in person and virtually. Uh, make sure to come tomorrow if you weren't heard so that you can be heard uh, fully. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is item number four, which is an action item approval of the December 2022 Oakland meeting minutes. Um, so the meetings were the minutes were circul circulated to task force members in advance. Are there any questions, um, corrections, amendments around the minutes from December? Hearing no. Um, Oh, sorry. Member Grozzi, you're recognized. Uh, I, I have just some really minor edits on page 7 and page 8 um, that I can just give to the members. There, there's no serious content change, just edit fixes. I, I can't control the mic from here. My mic doesn't work. Thank you. Okay. Did okay. you want to share what the things are? Sure. I mean, it's just um, on page 7. It is uh, in the first paragraph. It's just fixing the sentence. It's uh, concluded by stating that reparations should provide an escape plan and are needed to repair. And there was just something missing in the sentence. And so I added that to delete the words and are needed. And then this, the sentence works. On page uh, eight, in the uh, paragraph under pathologizing the African American family. Uh, it says, this narrative has been with us for generations because impressions of black families have been, have based on the news, television, 
So there's just a, an easy fix to that. Instead of because, it would be for generations and these impressions of black families have been reinforced on the news, et cetera, et cetera. That's it. Do you want to raise a motion for that, or? I don't think we need a motion to that. Okay, right, so. Just note that those corrections will be made. Okay, so, but there still needs to be a motion to approve the minutes. So. Yes. Okay, is there a second? With the correct Right, but there needs to be a proper motion for whoever is doing it. So, who's doing that? Thank you. Is there a second? Second. It has been properly moved by Vice Chair Brown and properly seconded by Senator Bradford that we approve the minutes as corrected uh, by Member Grills. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin with Chair more for the uh, motion, I'm sorry, for the vote to accept the minutes as corrected. Chair Moore? Aye. Vice Chair Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford vo votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Member Holder votes aye. Member Joan Sawyer? Aye. Member Joan Sawyer votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. <clears throat> Excuse me. Madam Chair, there were nine members present in voting. There were nine ayes and zero nays. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. There are nine ayes and zero nays, and so the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Uh, the, meeting, the minutes are adopted as corrected um, with the corrections that Member Grills um, raised. So the next item of the agenda is item number five, which is discussion and potential action. Advisory committees report on recommended answers to experts' five questions, economic expert analyses, presented by myself, Member Lewis, um, and any economic experts who are here. Um, before we begin, um, I just want to take inventory. Are the economists on the line? Or in person, okay. Dr. Dr. Spriggs and Kramer are on. Great, fantastic. Okay, so then I will turn to uh, member Jovan Scott Lewis who can get us started on this robust discussion. <laughs> Microphone on? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. So we, so we have still the hour and a half, or are we just going to 11.45? We have a time or this? Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. So we are here to discuss the, the, the five key questions that effectively frame, in, in principle, the, you know, the kind of second part of the eligibility component that focuses on, on residency and how residency impacts the, the eligibility for what we recommend, but also the process by which we provide the, the recommended reparations. And so the five key questions, are they not gonna be, are they, do we have a, a slide for them or? Okay, I'll read, I'll read them aloud just so everybody can, can know. Um, so the five key questions are, are number one, what are the damage time frames? Uh, number two, will there be a California residency requirement? Number three, what year determines the beginning of harm? Um, are there different starting points and end points for each atrocity category? Uh, number four, will direct victims and or all African American descendants of US slavery in California who meet the residency requirement be compensated? Um, and number five, how will reparations be paid and measured to ensure the form of payment aligns with the estimated damages? And so the, the task force you know, has been provided with the, the preliminary suggestions that uh, Chair Moore and I have come up with. Uh, can we c confirm you have, you have what we've come up with? 
everybody's received? Uh, yes, everybody's received okay. it, and, and, and we have the experts who are, I just want to note, the experts are behind you on the screen, right, wonderful. Uh, so that they know as well, and to introduce them to the public that those are the experts. Okay, so we have on the screen right now, good morning, sir, uh, Dr. William Spriggs, and I believe also Dr. Thomas Kramer, Kramer is with us as well. Uh, video is not working. Okay. <clears throat> and so the damage time frames are organized or concerned with the, the five areas of harm that we have determined um, are appropriately uh, responded to through financial, financial compensation or that which can be you know, calculated to provide financial compensation. And those are unjust property takings, the devaluation of black businesses, housing discrimination, mass incarceration over policing, and health harms. And so the recommended timeframes for the first, uh, unjust property takings, uh, will be the period from 1900 uh, through to the present. The time frame for the devaluation of black businesses is 1900 through the present. Um, housing discrimination uh, has been determined to, to, to be, in principle, the period of, of redlining uh, from 1933 to 1977 but there is consideration for expanding that scope from 1900 to the present. The period of mass incarceration over, mass incarceration over policing um, from 1970 to the present, and then the period of health harms from 1900 to the present. And so to explain part of the rationale for some of these, these, these timelines, um, we have to understand that those timelines are primarily informed by available data right, to establish and therefore calculate the harms experienced by the eligible community. And so it's important for us to recognize, in fact, that we know that harms are ongoing. We know that harms have existed prior to some of the dates that I've just read aloud. But in order to have a, a, a feasible and a legitimate financial baseline or basis for a financial um, rationale, we have to rely upon what the available data are um, to this point. So I will invite the economic experts to kind of, you know, expand upon that if they feel appropriate and if it's helpful to help uh, explain the methodology behind coming up with the calculations for these five, these five areas. Before we deal, Doc, for these specifics, I wish to say, if we are historically on point and accurate, the harm began. The harm began when Peter Burnett became governor of this state. I think it ought to be in our document. Who was an arch racist and threw out his trek across the Oregon Trail, came to these parts with his mean, racist, arrogant, bigoted attitude toward blacks. When he settled that town up in the Oregon Territory, Germantown, first effectual act of business was not how a cabin should be built, not how a road should be built, but it was an ordinance that no blacks or mulattoes would be permitted to settle in that town. And if they were caught there, they would be beaten every six months until they left town. And when he led that wagon train down here to California in 1848, Settled up there around Southersfield, got involved in politics and emerged to become the first governor of this state. Again, his first official act of business was an anti-black measure that no blacks would be permitted to settle in California at all. Thank God it didn't pass. But he wouldn't stop there. His insanity and his meanness continued. Well, he was slick and sleazy enough to get on the state Supreme Court and win 
that case, the civil rights case of the West, got to the court involving R.C. Lee from our native state of Mississippi, who was brought here, enslaved by Charles Stovall. Long short of it is, friends, is that this man, Peter Burnett, still had it in his bones that he was on the side of the minority and voted to send R.C. Lee back to Mississippi as an enslaved person, though California was, in 1850, entering, entered into this union as a free state. Why did I sat on this history? The groundwork was laid. Body politic was put in place to be mean to black folk. And you're talking about today when even those other folks are saying they don't want our history to be studied because it would make the children feel bad. How do you think black children would feel bad, too? <laughs> Knowing that this state in which we reside today Jump Street, Ground Zero, was mean as hell to black folks. So we should make sure that that's in that preamble. I know it may be poetic and all that stuff, so we're not dealing with specific. But it ought to be there so that the record will be on high and we will tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So let us be truth tellers and lay the foundation that this state has always been in this political sentiment, <coughs> anti-black. And that's why today we are down to about 6% of this population because foundation was laid from the beginning. To use the word of Abraham, it was stamped from the beginning. And we've never wiped it out. We've never exercised it this demon of anti-blackness from the psychic, the emotions, and the politic of this state. Thank you, Dr. Brown. I'm <clears throat> Can I ask a question? I'll just say that, um, so tomorrow we're going to go through this consolidated list of proposals. So as you all know, just to give context, each of the different task force members we serve on different advisory committees where we are tasked with coming up with proposals that correspond with each of the chapters in the report. And so um, at our December hearing in Oakland, we started to kind of report back on those advisory committee uh, pre preliminary proposals. I'm on the committee for enslavement and in December, you know, Dr. Brown raised the same issue around, you know, we need to include a censure of you know, the first elected governor um, of the state, Peter Hardiman Burnett. And so many different people around the task force gave advice on the different advisory committee's report backs. And so I just wanted to give assurance that um, from December until now, you'll see an updated from my committee, for instance, um, on enslavement where, you know, I updated hearing from Dr. Brown's uh, feedback that, you know, one of the proposals is, you know, the state of California has to give an apology for its role in perpetuating in the institution of slavery. Given the feedback from Dr. Brown in December, I updated that proposal to include that the state of California has to also, um, in that apology, um, publicly censure or admonish Peter Hardiman Burnett as the first elected governor of California. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, that's going to be discussed further tomorrow, but I wanted to get a clarifying question because on this agenda item that we're discussing today, this is the advisory committee on economics me, that me and Joe Bon Scott Lewis are on the committee for. And our task is to you know, uh, answer these five questions posed by our five member econo uh, ec economist team to ascertain what could reparations in the form of compensation or cash payments look like. And so one of the questions that we're posed to answer is, when does the harm occur? And so, you know, me and Dr. Dovan Scott Lewis in our, in our committee meetings, um, 
you know, since December, we've been wrestling with that. Hearing public comment as well, where people are saying, for instance, housing discrimination. Housing discrimination has, is an ongoing harm. Why should the cutoff be from 1933 to 1977, for instance, right? Just kind of giving more context to this conversation. And so, you know, as Jovan, uh, member Jovan Scott Lewis was, state, was stating, you know, we're trying to rework hearing from feedback from task force members and members of the public around what these dates could be uh, for the harm. And so I wanted to ask Vice Chair Brown, as of right now, as Ms. Member Jovan uh, Scott Lewis stated, uh, most of the harms, you know, the, the year that, uh, the, start, the start year for all of these harms we're saying is 1900. I wanna clarify, are you asking that we um, move the harm uh, a start date up to 1849-1850 when uh, Governor Hardiman, uh, Peter Hardiman Burnett was the governor. Correct. That's when it started. Okay. Thank you. Duly noted. Okay. I just wanted to get that clarification. Sorry. Go ahead. No, that's 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 helpful. Um, and thank you for updating the public on on your work with with the with regard to the chapter on enslavement. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, I think, you know, Dr. Brown, it's important that, that you provide this history of, about the, the first governor of the state because it helps to explain exactly how, right, the harms that were initiated and then perfected against African Americans in this country during a period of slavery continue to be reproduced, right, throughout state formation over the development of the, the, the early years of this country. Um, and so, we shouldn't be surprised, right, that we're finding what we're finding in this state's history. Because with this one gentleman alone, uh, you know, uh, uh, Burnett, you see exactly how he has imported, right, the very racist principles, right, that governed other parts of this country into the formation of what was then the new state of California. Um, so it's important that we understand exactly that the legacies that we're talking about are real. They're material, they're intentional, and they have always been policy-based, right? Um, and so, you know, in that, in that, you know, in that same token, what, what the economist's job is, is to say, well, how can we calculate, right? How can we calculate that cost? And so we also understand, and there was a gentleman here earlier who, you know, I think kindly gave a, a DNA kit to, to one of the audience members, right? His argument, thank you again, that was a very kind gesture. You know, your argument, sir, as you were talking was that, right, you know, the, the, the denial of information, right, is a kind of harm. It is an injury. And we understand that one of the biggest harms, one of the biggest injuries, has been the denial of African American history, right? And the intentional snuffing out of African American knowledge of self, right? Some of you know, right, I did research for nearly a decade in Tulsa, Oklahoma on the Tulsa race massacre, right? Within a week of the race massacre, the city of Tulsa engaged in a campaign to cover up everything that happened on those two days in 1921. The reason why they did that was because despite the racism that they happily engaged in, they knew that that racism, right, would in fact impact the bottom line because Tulsa was a burgeoning oil economy. And nobody would want to come to Tulsa and do business if it, was, if it had this reputation of being a, a site of racial unrest, right? And so what we, what we are working against is this issue of the, the kind of willful harm, right, of erasing from the records, right, the injuries, the dirty deeds, right, that have been meted out against African Americans in this state. And so the economist's job, right, within the time frame and the resource they've been provided is to say, well, how can we recover the data that we can use to make a calculation, right? And so, when we have these dates in these five areas, these dates are provided to give us a framework around which the economists can build a model for calculating right, economic compensation. And so in principle, and this is why I began my comments by saying we know that the harms right, predate some of these dates. We know that the harms are ongoing, right? but part of the, the work is to find the data right? to incorporate the data into right, a verifiable calculation 
so that we can provide figures, right? so that we can build a proposal around figures. And so I just want us to keep in mind that this is, this is the challenge, right? Because I know in the December meeting there were comments um, you know, a, a, about numbers, and we know that certain media outlets have been pushing out you know, uh, incorrectly, falsely, right? with, with bad faith intentions, false numbers. Right? But what I want us to understand is that the economists are actively still working on those numbers. Right? And so we had, thank you. Uh, and, and it's important that we understand, because even in public comment, you know, I'm hearing things about $200,000, and you know, the task force has not stated any figures. We have not done that. We're, we're having that conversation literally right now so we can get to a point where once we have figures coming back from the economic uh, experts, we can then present those figures to you with our authority. Now, again, and I clarified this in December, the number of $233,000 right, that had come up in some media uh, discussions, that was a number that was a calculation based upon housing discrimination alone in the periods of 1933 to 1977, right? So I, I want to be clear, we're still working on it. We are here today to deliberate these five areas, right? These five areas will form the basis of the financial compensation that we will hopefully be recommending to the state. All right, All right so, so Dr. Spriggs and Kramer, again, welcome. I, I you know, would, would welcome if you, if you want to provide a kind of update on where you are in this process, and if you want to, uh, again, elaborate on some of the methodologies that you're using so that the public understands exactly you know, how we're getting, you know, first of all, getting along, uh, and, and uh, um, how we are getting towards um, some of the figures that we will you know, deliberate as a task force. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lewis. Uh, we put in a series of data requests and we're beginning to get responses to some of those data requests. We understand that the answer in the end may be that some of the data we would like to have may not be available. And then we will be in discussion with you, uh, the task force, about alternatives we may pursue if we don't get the ideal data sets. But the, the state of the issue is that economists have gotten much better at understanding the causal implications of things like redlining, where we have gotten better at understanding where redlining occurred compared to where it didn't, and coming up with estimates of the decline in value for housing and the increase in segregation of African Americans specifically as a result of redlining, meaning that African Americans not only lost home value within the areas that have been redlined, but they also lost housing opportunities outside those segregated areas. And so we're able to come up with fairly accurate estimates of what did that mean for African Americans in terms of home ownership, these effects appear to dissipate over time because over time, absent redlining, absent overt discrimination in housing, absent those initial forces, some of, some of these bad effects seem, seem to, to decline. And so that's the sense of which we talk about where that portion of that type of discrimination seems to have gone away. And that red line is a local government function, the federal government gave local authorities the ability to create these maps, but they weren't federal maps, they were local maps. And so this, this is not the action of private developers, 
who put in place race covenants, upon which we know there's a high correlation with the redlining. These are the acts of the actual local government. So, so we're talking about that was a real harm. We know it was a harm. And, and, and we know it had this lasting impact over decades after these initial decisions, in part because discrimination remained legal beyond the initial action. So that's the type of thing we're doing. To your point earlier, the, what, what Dr. Brown raised is the sense, the further sense, that this was intentional, that this was not just an accident that, oh, this so happened to Black people. There's the record that Dr. Brown is talking about to make clear that this was intentional. Many people would want to argue that, well, they just draw some lines and the lines just happen to correlate with where Black people live or did not live. And that was an accident. But the historical record is important for understanding the sense in which this collusion within the marketplace had a real history to it. And that the more credible argument is that that redlining was something that was intentional because the collusion had been taking place for as Dr. Brown documented from the inception of California. So this became another instrument of that collusion. You, you pointed out some other areas that we know are the results of, of segregation, segregation in healthcare, the disproportionate over-policing of Black people. We have, in economics, growing studies and evidence of the impact on the community, not just on those who are incarcerated, but the act of incarceration has impacts on those not incarcerated. If you are in an elementary school and a large share of the children there have been impacted by incarceration. Some estimates are that in the Black community, as many as 63% of Black children, not necessarily their parent, but someone who's an adult they have a relationship with, uh, uncle, grand uncle, that, that close to 63% of Black children are affected by this disproportionate incarceration. And if you are not the subject of a mass incarceration, if, if your family never experienced it, there is still an impact that this affects performance in that school when it is subject to high levels of children who have had to endure this disparate impact. So we, we have estimates that have been developed to show these community impacts so that this disproportionate burden placed on the Black community, and we have the clear evidence of disparities in sentencing that point to a racial component that, as Dr. Brown documents, fulfills this history of some intentionality that this isn't just a happenstance. And, and we have estimates to show that there's a community impact. So this is how we're proceeding. We're proceeding on a body of literature that is developed that show these impacts go beyond specific individuals who could prove that they were the victims to the community at large. And, and that's why we, we're asking for additional information so that we can implement these models 
and, and as I indicated, we're beginning to receive the information uh, and we hope to get um, further responses. Thank you, Dr. Sprig. Um, yeah, and may I um, add to what Dr. Spriggs just said or, or basically reiterate, um, I also agree with Vice Chair Dr. Brown's comment that the injustice started much earlier with the um, uh, with California statehood um, and anti-blackness, as he as he described. Uh, but what we're trying to do with our calculations is stay staying conservative and having um, harms that were definitely due to the state of California, where we can demonstrate that, um, and. That means we have to, with data availability and so on, uh, to cut out a few pieces of that overall injustice. So our estimates will be low. They will be, they will be under underestimates of the total effect of discrimination, but they will be specific to the state of California. And the redlining example that Dr. Spriggs just described um, is a perfect example where the New Deal started with these redlining maps in 1933 um, until 1977 that remained in place um, with the Communities Reinvestment Act that finally banned the practice. Um, in, in the meantime, the state of California had, um, had a perfect um, discretion on how to apply these laws um, and did not do anything to ameliorate the effect of redlining on African-American residents. So we can take that time period and the housing discrepancy within that time period to estimate the damage to African-Americans in California. And that's an, another thing that I wanted to, um, to emphasize after the media coverage. Um, I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if the other experts agree, but I think that we uh, estimate what the losses are to African-Americans due to proven discrimination by the state of California, rather than estimating reparations, because that is, in my mind, more the, ta uh, the, um, uh, the task of the task force um, to determine what the reparations should be. We are, we are calculating the losses to African-Americans due to these policies. A fine distinction, but I think it's important to state that. I don't know, doc, Dr. Spriggs, if you agree or. Yeah, yes. I mean, we are not the task force. We don't pretend to be the task force. Uh, our, our role is simply to be experts to you and give you um, what we understand to be the best in uh, what economists have the ability to quantify um, in terms of the impact, the causal impact. It's not our job to determine how we use the information. It's not our job to tell you um, which arms to consider. Only we can say we don't know how to calculate some of the harms or that we don't have data to calculate it. And, and we, in our meetings with you have conveyed where, where we think we need the data and there has been every cooperation to provide the data where the data exists. Unfortunately, it's not always the case that data exists or that we can get it within the timeline of the task force. And we can and will let you know that we've been told that it's just we can't access it in time. And then you can make an appropriate decision on how to handle that. But we don't view our job as your job. Chair Brown, you had a comment? You're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the task force, I Please bear with me to, to, to make this point. Yes, we need exact data to make the case. 
However, there are flashpoints, timelines that indicate specific harm and damage was done to black people. One, in the Bay Area in 1858, April the 13th, over 850 blacks got on a ship to Commodore to resettle on Victoria Island at the invitation of Governor Douglas. Why were they leaving? They were leaving because blacks could not get housing. You couldn't serve on juries. There was no schools for us. It, it was horrible. Fast forward, another flashpoint. The so-called redevelopment. It began in 1948 with Justin Herman and Ali Odo. It was then that blacks were pushed out. They didn't have to leave, they were pushed out. And that redevelopment agency drained the economic base of black folks in, the, in San Francisco, where we had the largest number of black people back in the day after World War II. That is a definite point in history where you can get definite data. And then come on up to the 90s. What happened in South Central Los Angeles when our communities were gentrified and the gentrification didn't start with just the local community. It started up at the top when the immigration department of this country was so racist that it opened the floodgates to other com nations. And I'm not being xenophobic, not being nationalistic. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. And consequently, we became victims of genocide. There was a one race that was pushed out while everybody else gained. Now don't tell me that's not harm to black people. Don't tell me that doesn't represent specificities. That indicates that the harms were done at specific times in which our communities were destroyed by public policy and not by just individual actions. I rest my case there that there is every indication that we shouldn't let any senator, assembly person, or governor get by and make sure our minds are always sharp and quick to call them out in which they did definite harms to us because of the color of our skin. So, so thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Drs. Kramer and Spriggs. Um, so, so I mean, and your point is 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 shared, right? I don't think anybody anybody disputes, you know, either the principle or the practicalities of what you're of what you're proposing, sir. Um, you know, as as Dr. Spriggs mentioned, there is ongoing request for for data, right? And so, and this is why, again, it's important to note that we have not provided any figures because we are continuously asking for more data, right? The economists are in, in incorporating that data as it comes in into their model, right? And so I, I, I wanted us, you know, I, I think warn everybody, right? That the numbers will take, you know, perhaps as, as much time as we can allow them to take because we want to do our best to actually provide an accounting of these harms. And we want to do our best to provide, right, a figure that represents, right? those harms that also can then do the thing called repair, <laughs> right? Um, so the economics team is deeply devoted to getting this done right. They are deeply devoted to bringing in every single possible piece of data that they can get to make an accounting of this history of harm. 
um, and to provide an appropriate response in terms of compensation. I think what we need to do as a task force is, you know, and you've already added, I think, some much needed clarification to this first question, which is to say, okay, we can even bring back, you know, the period of, of, of harms to, you know, 1848, if you'd like, you know, with an addendum saying that, well, within the scope of the life of the task force, the data that we were able to collect and, and, and model out represents the period from X date to X date. And again, this is ongoing. So as the economists continue to get data, these dates themselves will be updated, or in principle, they can be updated. So what we basically are asking for the task force today is to, you know, in principle, understand what's happening, understand where we are with regard to question number one and the time frames, and to provide any feedback. You know, and then Dr. Brown has begun the process of providing feedback. Thank you, that's super helpful. And Member Montgomery Sepp has a question. Um, thank you. Um, I, my question is just about, it is about um, how, if there is a way uh, to quantify some of the harms via policy declarations, proclamations that that first governor made, if there is a way to, to, to quantify that as a separate category. I know that we as a task force voted on these categories, right? And you all have been doing work on these categories based on our action. Is there a way to, I don't want to use the word buffer uh, for e you know each current category we have, but is there a way to provide a link through the information we already have that would increase the harm for the categories that we're working with? Because obviously what the governor did was a foundation for uh, all of these other different things. So I guess the question is, it, is there an appropriate way to quantify what we know to be true in a, in a way that reflects in the compensation and the economics of this? So, so I think doctors, Dr. Spriggs and Kramer would have to answer the question definitively. You know, I, I, so what we should understand is what, what happened, right? Like, so how do we get to these five areas? You know, so for the record, you know, all of the areas that we identified, right, were up for a kind of economic calculation, right? So this is not just these five areas alone that we, the task force, said, we only think these are the five areas that are you know, worthy of a determination of what an economic calculation should be for, say, direct compensation. Looking at the total sum of the nearly dozen areas right, that we've identified you know, through the first year of our work, these five areas were the five areas that the economists said we can actually model right, a kind of compensation-based framework around. I mean, so we should understand that we have these five areas as a result of the economist effectively testing to see if an economic model could be created around all of the, or each of the areas. And these are the five that they said that they would, could with, with certainty say we can produce right, an economic model around. Um, and so that's why for some of the other areas you know, that come up in interim report, some of the other areas that, that many of us have as our respective portfolios, there may not be an economic uh, compensation component to those areas, right? And so the, the, the issue, you know, and, and I don't want to belabor this matter of data, right? And I've established hopefully that, the, you know, a lack of data is a form of harm, right? So, and, and so I want to I wanna make sure that we understand that this is not a lack of due diligence on the part of the economic experts team, right? And so we can know things. You know, we know things happened, right? But if we're going to actually put forward an economic proposal, we have to be able to quantify the things that have happened. And we can, listen, we can go into that as a whole separate, you know, argument about, you know, but we understand, you get into a car accident out on the street, someone's going to show up and measure the degree of damage. And you're going to have to prove that there was damage, right? And so we can have an argument about the principle of that, but, you know, that's beyond the scope of our work, I think. So, you know, again, just to give you the history, 
all of the 12 areas, let's call them 12 areas, right, were, were, were put forward to the economic experts to say, okay, can we find numbers for these areas? Right? And the five that we've come back to that I listed out for you or read aloud for you earlier, right? number one being unjust property takings, right? were the areas that they said that they could, with, with some validity right, and confidence, provide numbers for. And we understand the political climate that we're in, the numbers have to be accurate. Right? We can't just make up numbers here. Right? They have to be able to be defended. And, so, and this is the core principle that the economic experts have been working with being able to have defensible numbers, right? Um, and so in, in principle, you know, dear colleague, I think, yes, you know, like, as the work continues, you know, we, can, we could do it, you know, if the, if the information, if the data becomes available. Mm -hmm. um, as Dr. Spriggs says, they're in a the process of currently receiving more data. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully, you know, depending on what the demands are of our time frame here, you know, we could have, you know, uh, we, we could be having a slightly different conversation come next meeting. But for the moment, this is where we are. And so I think, you know, you, the, again, the feedback that we've gotten from, from Dr. Brown, you know, has already been, I think, very instructive, right? Which is to say that, you know, depending on where we end up with the numbers, right, with these time frames, we do need to make very clear, right, that there is still an open-ended component to this, where we have to understand the actual beginnings of these harms, and to make a clear note that the actual time frame of harms, right, may be differently related to the time frame which, by which we can calculate those harms, right? And I think we should, we should absolutely do that, sir. So thank you for that recommendation. And, and I would also add that what we what we as the expert team are recommending, first of all, it's losses to African-Americans in terms of intergenerational wealth. But um, so, and it's not the final reparations that's to be determined by the task force. Um, and it's, uh, what we can also do is point out how additional data could lead to further estimates. So as, as you said, it's an open-ended process. Um, and um, then, of course, the task force can demand pain, pain and suffering, which we can't quantify um, based on, on, on the losses that we calculate. Um, there, there can be other demands made, but uh, what we as the expert team is do, uh, are doing is just a, um, estimating the losses to African Americans in terms of intergenerational wealth and um, in, so we come up with a conservative estimate, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's all that reparations should be. That's to be determined by the task force. Okay, thank you. Uh, member yes, let's, let, let's be clear. The task force is free to do what it can under its mandate. The fact that we don't have an economic model or that we have the data doesn't preclude the task force from doing what it understands is its duty under the mandate. I would add that some of the things that Dr. Brown raised, however, are conceptually difficult to measure the cost because if you discourage black people from moving to California, the harm is to black people who are still in Mississippi, not the people who are in California. This is a conceptually difficult thing to measure. It, it, it's a harm done to the black people of the United States. And, and, and conceptually, that's just a difficult thing to model. It's a what, what if, um, what if a black family stayed in Mississippi? And didn't come to California, and as I understand, you 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 understand your ability to grant reparations is the ability to grant reparations to current citizens of California. So, so some of these harms have different uh, different conceptual challenges, and even if we could calculate it. And, and I would say to, to Dr. Brown, the eminent domain and the 
land takings includes 1948 in San Francisco. That's explicitly within what we think we can calculate. Okay, so we're going to go to Member John Sawyer and then uh, back to Vice Chair Brown. Um, actually, this is a really good conversation. And, I, and what I don't want to leave out is just this whole discussion um, that, I'm, that I've been aware of for quite a while, something called epigenetics, that who you are is based on um, socialization. And in the writings of, of Willie Lynch in The Making of a Slave, it's about inculcating that whole slim slave mentality in just about everybody in this room so that we cannot overcome who we are because it's embedded in our genes through years and years and centuries and centuries of prolonged slavery. Now, I don't know if this is, uh, I know it's difficult for the economists because I, I know this, there's this left brain, right brain. I'm a left brain person where one and one can actually be three as opposed to the economists where one and one will always be two. Um, and, and so um, I, I, I can understand how the economists versus kind of the socio ecologists may, may not be able to come together. Um, but I do know when Brown versus Board of Education and the early um, data that came out of what the social sciences did, where they would take a white doll and a black doll and ask kids what they thought of that, they used that in overturning separate but equal. Because we all know it was separate, but it was never equal. It was always unequal. But they tried to train us to believe that it was the same. And so maybe, um, we can not, not exclude the economists, but bring in some social scientists to come in and maybe they have some data or they have a methodology to quali quantify it, just like Thurgood Marshall and the others were able to find legal precedents to prove a social uh, construct, to be able to take it into the courts and to prove that separate but equal was unjust. And ultimately, we got affirmative action and a lot of other things. And so maybe we need to also bring in some other social scientists in the discussion, working with the economists, because maybe we need to, to quantify that. Because I firmly believe that a lot of the problems that we have now are within our genes, and, it, and we're going to have to do a lot to get it out of us, the way we behave. If you ever read The Making of a Slave, and some of the things that are going on now in this room and outside this room and with our community, um, those, those behavior patterns that the slave master used on us is still kind of prevalent today on us in our society right now. And so uh, how, do you, how do you reverse that? And maybe we even just have that conversation with the social scientists. How do you reverse centuries and centuries of oppression out of the people? so that we can then put that in our, our data and then be able to quantify it and then move forward. And so uh, if there's a way we can quickly do it, not, we, we're, I'm not talking about some, another year study. It's something we can come back next month, maybe with someone that can give us some idea on how we can quantify that. Quantify what they have done lately to us. If it's too encumbersome, if it's too difficult to go back right, right. to the history that I gave you, over the last 75 years, the evidence is there. Or even the last 40 years. Look around these communities where we used to have our watering hole. that were torn up by a public policy that just happened. And you mean to tell me one can claim that we don't have rights to say you owe us for that? I just used 10 or 12 blocks in San Francisco, the Fillmore. All of those Victorian homes 
that our ancestors acquired, who are descendants of enslaved persons, were stolen from black people. You go to many of those churches there, they used to be jumping. 25 years ago, you throw a rock, it won't hit nobody. That's the exclusion of a people that's pushing a people out. So all we need to do is just deal with what you've done lately that has caused us to not have quality education. Read Kozil's book on savage inequality, where he talks about the disparities in education. Just deal with that. These schools in the inner city community over against those that are out in suburbia. The evidence is there. Let's just state the case and tell them it's time to pay up. That's all. Then we'll turn to member Lewis. Oh, and Brad. Just uh, 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 for this question and what has been brought forward by committee members as to the time frame for each atrocity that we're talking about, what I think is that we should land. Uh, I think I am okay with the recommendation with the understanding that the final decision is going to be up to us as to what we move forward to the legislature, and that if we want to look at other types of damage, you know, damages, if we want to add, you know, at, at the point where we have some, something that is solidified from the economists because they're going to do what they do, right, which is why we brought them in, um, I, I think that that is um, what we should do at least to answer the first question here, that we have to settle on those, those time frames and then you know, understanding that we can do, we're going to have the power to do what we need to do um, at the end of the day. We just have to get there. So that's what I would um, suggest. I would just add on to what uh, Dr. Brown stated as to we can look at what's happening today. Case in point is just what happened two weeks ago with the Bruce family in Manhattan Beach and they're deciding to sell the property. And people called me as the author of the bill and asked why. And it's all because of what was once restrictive covenants, what was once redlining is now zoning. And the city would not rezone the property. And people need to understand the historical effects of zoning because zoning didn't come into place until 1948 after Thurgood Marshall and Lauren Miller won that case and to Supreme Court that ruled restrictive covenants were illegal. And what did cities do? They went to zoning, R1s, R2s. And the reason the Bruce family is selling that property today because they know the city will never let them rezone the property to do what their great-great-grandparents had there or to match what's there right now, million-dollar condos. That property is currently zoned for public use only, so it has no value as it relates to redevelopment. So zoning today still plays an effect, especially in African-American communities. So we need to factor that in as well. Member Holder, you're recognized. Yeah, I mean, what we're doing here is very similar to what I do you know, in trial prep and in court every day as a trial lawyer. And so we are just proving up damages for, in this case, for centuries of intentional discrimination. Um, what I would suggest is that, I mean, our, we all have the same goal here. We want to make sure that this is legally viable and legally defensible. And that's why we're all being very cautious and very careful. And that's commendable. Um, because at the end of the day, when the rubber hits the road, this is going to go to court. And we better be able to defend it in court. So what I would suggest is that we think about we think about economic genocide, which is why we have brought the economists in here to give us their economic models for genocide. And we think about cultural genocide. The economic genocide 
is, is being proven by the, the economists with hard empirical data, documents, etc. The cultural genocide is a qualitative model that's based on the anecdotal evidence that we have already collected over the last 18 months. And we are the social scientists who can assign a number to that cultural genocide piece. And within the legal, the, the civil legal context, when you're looking at intentional discrimination, you're looking at both quantitative and qualitative, right? These economists are giving us the quantitative model. Now we are going to create the qualitative model, and they are both valid within our American legal system and defensible. We are the social scientists. We can come up with a number for the cultural genocide piece. Well, I, we have four more areas to go over, but um, <laughs> I told y'all last meeting we needed to have a whole day for this section alone, but people don't want to listen to me. That's all right. Um, I'll be trying. So, um, so I want to respond to a few things. Um, and what everybody I said is absolutely correct. You know, what I want us to understand is that if you go back to the Fillmore, if you go back to, you know, pretty much any black community, historical, contemporary, in this country, in this state, you know, there is housing discrimination, right, that leads, you know, to some extent. So the things that you talked about, a lot of those policies began during this period that the economists have identified, right? So we're talking about the, the demolition of communities in North Oakland, right, near where I live, you know, that occurred as a result of the erection of the, the highway, right, which occurred as a result of the local, um, the, the local execution of the 1956 Federal Highway Act. Now, what we're talking about, if you're looking at the complete, you know, like decimation of a black neighborhood, right, it isn't just one injury that, that, that causes it, right? So it's housing, right? And so you remove the people, as many as you can, through housing discrimination. You prevent the arrival of as many black people as you can. And then what do you do for those who remain? You do whatever you can to lock them up. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And for those who remain, you do whatever you can to deprive them of industry. Right? To deprive them, right? of the ability to, you know, to, to provide for their families. So if you look at the five areas, right, these five questions, right, what you have really is a kind of the, you know, it's not, it's not comprehensive, but what you have are some of the key components of the ecosystem, right, that we can think of as being the anti-black genocide that occurred in the state of California, right? Because if you're taking away property, right, the property that re remains, right, fine. But then you have businesses, yeah. the commercial heart. Yeah. So then you, you go away and you go about the business of devaluing those businesses, yeah. right? Then you take away housing. And then you lock the people up that remain, right? And then those who you don't get, you create a condition, an environment of environmental harms that makes the remaining population sick, right? Sick. Unable to work. So what, what I'm saying is that we have to understand, right, that we are dealing with a comprehensive program here. We have to also understand that this, is, these, this discussion is, is for the economic experts, <laughs> right? There are corresponding chapters, right, to each of these themes. Right, within those chapters will be a figure, or, or I mean chapters of our recommendations, will be a figure for each of these issues alongside the complete discussion that we're having today. Right? And as Member Holder mentioned, we do, and as, as, as Dr. Spriggs said, right, they're doing the calculations. Right? We do what we will with the numbers. Right? We, can, we can go ahead with the numbers that they provide, right? and we can go in any direction. Right, with those numbers. So we can do that work. And, it's, it's, and as Dr. Spriggs rightly said, they're not the task force, right? 
but the scope of work that we provided them is to say, go out and see what you can calculate. They've come back and they said, this is what we can calculate, this is how, right? And so what we can do is in terms of, in terms of economic recommendations, we can use those calculations as a starting point, right? We can use the numbers that result from those calculations as a starting point. And it's gonna be our job over the next few months, um, right, to, to correspond with what we believe is right for compensation. So I wanted to kind of just say that, and I and I think, and I think you know, uh, Mem Member Bradford, you're absolutely correct, right, with this issue of zoning. The the thing that we have to we have to try and figure out is, okay, well, can we incorporate it? And so we can make these requests, right? And and, and the economics team has been here all along, asking for us to provide them requests. They've been begging for us to give them, say, can you go find this out? Can you go find this out? Right? And to be fair, right, we've told them what we've told them, and they've gone away and they've done what we've asked them to do, right? And so I think, you know, as they continue to, um, to go away and do their work, um, you know, you all, I believe, can, through the proper channels, communicate to me and, 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 and share more, and we can communicate to the uh, economic experts and say, okay, can you go and figure out maybe what's happening you know, around the implications of zoning? But again, it's also important to remember that the scope of work is looking into state harms. And that gets tricky. It gets tricky, right? You know, we live where we live. We understand when a new development you know, comes to town, right? How does that happen, right? We understand that many of these things are public and private partnerships. We understand that sometimes policies create these loopholes or create just enough space, right? Just enough room, right? For something to, to effectively be legal, effectively be non-discriminatory in principle, no, no, sorry, in practice, but in principle, outright racist. And so I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a job in Sacramento, you know? Um, but what I'm saying is that there are, there are moments, and there will be a moment for us to actually, you know, I think broach those topics in, 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 you know, in our final recommendations. And, um, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but we also have to think about the relationship between, um, I'm gonna say, right, between the state project for reparations and the federal project for reparations, right? We have to, we have to, we have to make sure that we are actually, uh, I appreciate that. Um, that, 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 it was like two, yeah, yeah, all right. Um, I'll take what I can get, it's been a, you know. Uh, all right. No, 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 that's fine. But, you know, Dr. Webb in the beginning of today, I was listening to her very carefully. She was telling us exactly what is what, right? And, and, there, and there is an end goal here, right? That doesn't end in California, right? And I think, and I think we have to be very mindful of, of that as well as we go away and do our work because also AB 3121 encourages us to right, encourage a federal study and encourage federal reparations. So, so I want us to just be mindful of the, the pieces that we're putting together here. Um, and and I, wanna, I wanna thank you know, the economic experts for, for doing what they, what, what they do with what we, we give them. Um, I appreciate you. Um, so I know we don't have a lot of time, um, but there are some, there's actually a bigger <laughs> question that we need to, we need to ask and answer um, today. Um, so again, you know, we have, you know, I, I've taken on board the, the, the comments, I've, I've taken notes of, that the task force has provided. I don't think I need to bring a, bring a motion or recap or anything. Um, the second question is, will there be a California residency requirement? The third question is, uh, what year determines the beginning of harm? We've effectively you know, discussed the third question, so I don't think we need to go over it. Uh, the fourth question is, will direct victims and or all African-American descendants of US slavery in California um, who meet the residency requirement be compensated? And the last question is, how will reparations be paid and measured to ensure the form of payment aligns with the estimate of damages? And so um, I, I want us to move on to question number two and then skip number three and go on to number four. Um, and so, so Chair Moore and I, again, as the advisory group, recommended that there should be a California residency requirement. Um, you know, Chair Moore, maybe you can say more about that in a moment, just about how you know that expectation comes out of AB 3121. Um, the 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 question, however, is within that 
you know, around how residency should be determined in terms of the kind of experience of the state, uh, state sanctioned atrocity. Um, and I think that is related to the, the kind of fourth question, because what we need to consider, colleagues, is, you know, and I have my views and I'll share them, but, you know, again, property takings, devaluation of black businesses, housing discrimination, mass incarceration, health harms. You know, Dr. Dr. Spriggs, right, even helped to provide an, you know, uh, an illustration of how, again, all of these things represent an ecosystem, right, of injury. Um, they are, in, in fact, an environment, a condition of, of, of injury. And so what we have to work out is, are we going to be effectively asking that members of the eligible community, right, who can establish residency, right, do they have to establish residency, say, within these time frames, right, or do they simply qualify on the basis of being a California resident? Moreover, do we require that individuals then provide evidence of having experienced one of these particular atrocities, or do we say, again, this is a general condition of injury, right, of anti-blackness against this eligible community, and so therefore everyone is eligible once you meet the residency requirement. So this is what I want us to kind of, you know, to, to, to talk about, and I'll just pass it back over to you quickly, um, Chair Moore, just to kind of talk a little bit more about residency um, and perhaps some of the, like, the, the, the kind of issues around the question of residency. Yeah, sure. So uh, just to recap, as you stated, um, as members of the Economic Advisory Committee, um, we have came up with a preliminary recommendation that there should be a California residency requirement. And so we're really looking for feedback as to, um, you know, what that residency requirement will entail and then also to um, elaborate on the implications of our recommendation. So essentially, again, we're recommending that there should be a residency requirement, um, but the preliminary recommendation is that residency should be determined by when individuals within the community of eligibility initially experienced the state-sanctioned atrocity or the badge and incident of slavery. And so the implications of that, you know, we've heard through public comment, for instance, there are many people, African Americans, who were born and raised in California and because of state-sanctioned atrocities, for instance, may not live in California anymore. And under this preliminary recommendation, where we're recommending, one, that there should be a residency requirement, but it be tied to when um, the person, in, uh, 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 you know, experienced the harm, well, that would mean, the implications of that recommendation would mean that if you are not a current California resident, but you were once one, when you experienced that harm, you would be eligible for compensation. And so I just wanted to, we wanted to make that clear and get some feedback um, on that. Because I know, for instance, even Secretary Weber, when she gave expert testimony February of last year, I mean, she was clear in terms of, she thinks that only current California residents should be eligible. But under this preliminary recommendation from the Economic Advisory Committee, we're actually saying that um, if you experience the harm, um, you know, and you may not be a current resident now, you should still be eligible because when you did experience the atrocity, you were a resident. And we shouldn't necessarily punish people, um, you know, for the harms they endured, for not being able to withstand, you know, the state-sanctioned atrocities in California or something like that. So um, do you all have any feedback on that part? And then also, we have um, preliminarily uh, came up with some recommendations for how do you determine residency and you know, conversations are we want to keep it as broad as, uh, as possible because we don't want you know, the burden to be very heavy for those who would be um, a beneficiaries of this program. And so I won't list, <laughs> I won't list um, the entire or exhaustive list of different um, you know, um, records that we've pulled from, but most of them are, you know, public records like voter registration records, car registration records, organization membership records, uh, real estate deed records, uh, health department records, vital records, uh, tax assessor records, county jail records, voting records, probate records, even obituaries, uh, and, and uh, utility bills, mortgage bills, genealogical evidence, et cetera. Uh, Member Joe Sawyer, did you have a comment? Oh, okay. Letting Mr. Freiburg, if you could use some of those. <laughs> um, so, okay. That's pretty much it um, for that. But we would love to hear your feedback on the preliminary recommendation that 
Now, should there be a California residency requirement? Should it just be for current residents? Because the recommendation right now is that yes, there should be a requirement, but that the residency should be determined um, by when the state sanctioned atrocity occurred. Um, so that would open the door for folks who aren't currently living in California. Uh, Member Dantamaki, you're recognized. So thank you. You mentioned that Secretary Weber uh, was making the case of current residency requirement. And I wonder if you could, you know, explain that. I'd like to know more about that and the rationale for it. Um, yeah, I, just thinking back to her testimony in February of last year, um, when one of the task force members asked her opinion on it, essentially her opinion was that, you know, it should only be, um, you know, closed to current residents because, you know, the state of California, for instance, like, should the state be responsible for paying out compensation to folks who may not live in California presently? So that was essentially the argument for just keeping it to current California residents. that it should be current California residents with a certain length of time here in California because we don't want folks just to move into California in the next last 60 days or last year and, and claim this. I mean... No, no, just to clarify. So the first question around what should be the harm dates, 1900 to present, and then we discussed that present would be the day that Governor Gaffin Newsom signed the legislation, which would be sep September 30th, 2020. So, so just to like, just to illustrate, let's say housing, uh, well not housing discrimination, health harms. The first question that we came up with, the start and end date for, the, for health harms is 1900 to present, present being September 30th, 2020. Now the second part of the question is, should there be a residency requirement? So let's say, you know, I'm a black Californian. I left in 1982 or something like that. But I was in California from, you know, since I was born until the, to 1982. And I'm, you know, however years old. The point is, can I still be eligible as someone who left the state? Even though I was born and raised in California. Because I fit within already that criteria of being harmed from 1900 to 2020. Hopefully, that, I know that wasn't that clear, but... Um, no, I, I understand that, but I still think there needs to be some level of continuation of, uh, of living here in California. And if you leave and you've been 20 years removed, even though you were harmed, I, I, I just think it opens up. A can of worms there. It's going to be really hard to wrap our arms around. So, yeah. You don't want anyone to touch that. Huh? <laughs> yeah. This is not right. okay. There we go. I mean, could, can I compel like my colleagues to to to? give me their views on this matter. <laughs> I would love to kind of just hear everybody's thoughts. You know what I mean? Like, it's fine if, but, you know, so I appreciate that, Member Bradford, but it would be good just to kind of hear where, where we are. Because um, just hearing one response isn't really enough for us to, to, to have a sense of, of which direction to go. And we're working this out, yeah? This is not like, you know, it's an open book test. Test. I mean, but I mean, I know, but it's not an open book test. It's not an open book test, but it is. It is. It is. But I mean, but 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 you know, so joking aside, and that was a very bad joke too. But um, <laughs> it would be just. I mean, I think at, at this point we are getting to some really critical issues, and we and we do need we do need everybody's. You know, and it's fine to say I don't really know. That's fine. It's okay. Um, or I, I, I need more information to form my opinion, but you know we do need, I think, a little bit more to work off of, you know, from 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 each other. But this is like a, this is like the like one of the more major issues, you know. So, chair, if I could be recognized, I don't. Sorry, member Montgomery, step you're recognized. That's okay. Thank you. Um, I am thinking about 
as my boring self, um, I'm thinking about process. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking about. And I'm thinking about, I'm thinking through um, what would be the most feasible to make uh, this, not the easiest, but the most efficient way to get to the most people. So a question about the, the, the recommendation, Chair Moore, that if we, so a California re residency, I agree that that should, that should be a requirement. Um, we, we did this as we've talked about Dr. Weber with the, with the vision was that this would eventually get to the federal level, right? So I think that the California residency um, is definitely, we, we should go that route. And would that be, that would be as of the date that the bill was signed by the governor. Okay, so anybody that was a resident of California as of September 30th, 2020 would, would qualify. Is that, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I'm also leaning toward um, a current, current California residents, or we could do, because as, as Senator Bradford just said, if you moved 30 years ago, that's just, you, I'm not denying that someone has experienced harm, but that is a long time to, to, to come back, especially when our ultimate goal is to get to the feds where everybody gets their reparations. So I am thinking that we should, folks should be California residents as of September 30, 20, 20 and the and the only other thought process is if someone may be five years removed or ten years removed um but that might add another wrench as far as process and being able to get through claims and actually get this um the reparations and how whatever forms they come in out to to people so um that uh, that's my feedback. A bit further, member Montgomery said. So, you know, a part of it is, okay, so September 30, 2020, but then would you then therefore be eligible for all of the, the harms that have occurred up until that point? So meaning, do you then have to prove that you were resident on September 30, 2020, but then also a resident you know, on September 30, 1965, right, to qualify for housing discrimination? And then, or, you know, a, or resident you know, uh, in 1980 to qualify for you know, compensation around the harm of mass income. So, so the question, so you know, either way, you have to kind of prove a couple of things. Sure. I mean, in one version, or you can just say, you know, and that's kind of question four, right? Which is to say, here's a total sum of harms that, yes. that black American Californians within an eligible community have experienced, right? And so we could have a version where if you are a California resident mm -hmm. on September 30, 2020, right, you are eligible to receive, right, reparations in this compensatory, uh, compensatory form right. for all of the harms, right? From 1900 to, to you know, September 30, you know, 2020. So I think, you know, we have to make that decision. Um, and, you know, one is going to, you know, one version just requires that you prove residency on a particular date through a driver's license or whatever. The others say, oh, I have to go find, you know what I mean, my school enrollment, maybe right. my yearbook or whatever it is, you know, from, you know, from some other period. So I think, you know, it, it is, it is, you know, proving the contemporary residency that, that, that you and Member Bradford are, are suggesting, I think is fine, but that we have to then answer this other question, which is do you then have to additionally prove that you were resident at these other junctures that, that uh, uh, comport with the, the stated harms? A very good question. And I, I'm fighting my urge to complicate things further. Uh -huh with a baseline for anyone that has the original eligibility requirement that we've already voted on. Mm -hmm. Like a baseline for everybody. Right. 
And then because, I, you know, morally, should I get the same type of compensation for someone who has been in prison for 25 years based on mm -hmm. one of the atrocity categories? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a, you know, it's going to be a policy decision for us, but it's a moral decision as well. So um, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> but, uh, but But I'm thinking a baseline. Right. And then uh, evaluating atrocities on top of that, um, that could be a, a, okay. a way that we go. Thank you. I think, I think. I, yeah, I would agree. There has to be a minimum baseline. I don't know what that number is, but I would definitely, if I was making the decision, at least 20 years of residency here in the state right. of California, you know. At least that. So, uh, as of when the bill was signed, you'd at least be here at least 20 years, have gone to school, have, you know, served in the military, something that tied yeah. you here for more than a week, you know. You know, because so, so that's kind of, you know, so that's kind of what, you know, these, these, these different, these different atrocities and their timelines, you know, part of the timeline, you know, part of the use of the timeline is so the economists can determine how to come up with a number, right? Um, we have the option of using those timelines to then further determine eligibility, further refine eligibility, right? Um, or we don't have to use those timelines in that way. Uh, but what we do have to do is determine, you know, what, what the residency requirement is. So. So a baseline, I think, you know, I don't know how, how things work at your end of the, the process, right? So, you know, what, what rationale would you then say um, could support 20 years, right? I can understand a rationale that says we have these five atrocity areas. If you establish that you are a resident, you know, you know if, so if you've lived here, you know, if you've lived here um, from 1940, in principle, you would, you know, using that model, you would qualify for compensation based on all of the atrocity categories. Um, if you moved here in 1990, right, then you qualify for a subset of them. Um, so I can understand that rationale, you know, but I, I think it would be helpful to understand. So what is the, the determination of a baseline? Um, and how do they then relate to the atrocities that we say that we are going to be providing, you know, this financial compensation uh, as reparations uh, for? Girls, you're recognized. Can you cut my mic on? Thank you. Um, I think I have more questions and conundrums than I yeah, have answers. We're working them out. Um, and so I'll, I'll start with what is my baseline thinking. Um, which is, should there be a residency requirement? Yes. Then from there, it gets murky for me. So for example, how do we equate the depth of the harm with an arbitrary time period? Right, for example, the depth of my harm could be immense, but it may have happened in the last year because of California's ongoing policies and practices that discriminate against African Americans. Um, I'm also, another baseline for me is that we create something that's not overly complicated and that adds yet another burden on black folk um, to receive redress. My other baseline mm -hmm. is that this be as inclusive as possible because the harm is, um, it, it, it's, it's everywhere, it's omnipresent, mm -hmm. uh, and it touches all black folk. Um, so and then for me, then, you know, it raises questions. So what's not a long time or, and, and what's, you know, what, what, if, if we select a time frame, what's the rationale for that? And then why are we ignoring existing decisions that have been made in the state about residency? Two quick examples, residency as it relates to, um, in-state tuition fees for the Cal States and the UCs. Right now, it's, um, and it's a lot easier than it was when I moved to California to go to graduate school. Back then it was three years, now it's one year, immediately preceding the residence determination date. That's for the tuition for the California colleges and universities. Then when it comes to just residency requirements for the state itself, 
it has gone on record deciding what that is why are we not paying attention to that is just a basic question i have and for california residency per the state it's you're presumed to be a california resident for any taxable year in which you spend more than nine months in the state although you may have connections with another state if your stay in california is for other than a temporary or transitory purpose you are a california resident why are we adding such an incredible layer of complexity when the state itself has made it you know very very simple so so to answer the you know i i think the state wants to count people as residents you know for tax purposes right so i think they're very keen so they say yeah nine months okay that's enough you know and i think and 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 i think you know and I'm not necessarily advocating for the I'm, I'm asking the questions, right, to kind of to, to get us somewhere. But I think the idea of of thinking about these particular time frames and qualification within them is to get to exactly what you what you talked about, which is the depth, right? Because if you if you were a resident, right, in you know again 1965 and you remained a resident from 1965 to the present, you can see the depth, right? It's in that list of, of things that we're talking about here. Right? So, you know, housing discrimination, property taking, mass incarceration, and, and, and you experience it as an environment of, 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 of being a resident. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, we're, we're, we are, you know, Chair Moore and I were trying to, to, to respond to that primarily. You know, we, we even went even further afield, like, well, what does it actually mean to be a black Californian? You know what I mean? And like, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you feel? Because you could live here for a decade and not really feel like you're a black Californian, like you were formed by the state. Mm -hmm. And what, what drove that, that consideration, right? And that's not what we're proposing, but what drove that consideration is that in principle, we're arguing that, right, to be African-American, right, in the terms of the eligible community means that you have a heritage formed by the history of enslavement in this country, right? And so that's what makes you, in fact, you know, qualify as an as a, as a eligible, you know, as, a, as a, a member of the eligible community. And so we wondered if there was a similar, a similar kind of threshold, you know, for, for belonging to the state, right? That was in our preliminary stages of, of considering like how to approach this. But we arrived at, you know, eligibility within these, within these time frames, you know, effectively to try and get to this kind of depth of feeling, right? Um, a, a kind of sense of place, if you will. Um, and, and I think that, that's the reason why. Now, you know, if it's complicated, I don't know. You know, I think if, if you can, you know, it's complicated by the fact of what you do with people who have left the state, right? Mm -hmm. So if you were gentrified again and again and again and you left Oakland and you moved to Pittsburgh and you couldn't manage Pittsburgh and now you're in Reno, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you, you know, how do you, you know, account for that? But I think, you know, I don't know if the state Right, and its residency requirements actually, in my personal opinion, you know, is, you know, was crafted with the same principle, right, or with the same set of commitments that we have today, which is to say, well, mm -hmm. how do we account for injury, right, to the experience of injury, to the formative quality of injury, you know, for, for eligible black Americans in this, in this state. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the thinking. So, but what I've, what I've heard is there does seem to be, you know, growing consensus around a kind of like contemporary, you know, residency requirement, you know, the September 30, 2022, having been, you know, having established residency, you know, by that date. Um, I think, I think the question then, if we just hold that as a, as a preliminary agreement is, should we then say, if you are a resident on that date, right, you qualify for the total sum of the five atrocities? Or do you then have to say, well, I can also prove that I have been a resident starting from this date or that date. So in other words, September 30th, right, is the end date of eligibility, if you will. Should we also ask that they, that they provide some record of when they began residency so that we can then further determine, you know, what, you know, which of these areas do they then qualify for? You know, I, I, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, I still think about our most vulnerable mm -hmm. and what burdens we may place on them 
I think about, for example, um, the children in the child welfare system who may have a hard time mm -hmm. establishing that. Um, I think about the folks who've been unhoused and they may have difficulty establishing that. I think about the folks coming out of the jails and the prisons who, you know, it's not an easy feat to get documentation just for the present, let alone for the past. So I, I'm always mindful of, you know, let's not do more harm or do unintended harm as we establish our criteria. Member Holder and then Member Tamaki. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to what you had said. Um, I think when we're talking a bit about a baseline, that already indicates that we're not talking about the specialized atrocity categories, right? That takes it out of the specialized atrocity categories and time frames. So right now, in my mind, we're talking about residency for purposes of the baseline category. Does that make sense to you? Okay. And I would tend to agree that for purposes of the baseline category, we should keep it as simple as possible and keep it consistent with uh, with sort of uh, legal conventions. So if the convention in California is that after nine months you're a resident, then stick with that, because that way it, it seems less arbitrary. This is only for the baseline category. That's kind of how I see it. You know, it's just like the convention, for instance, is that you're an adult when you're 18, right? So I don't think that we should you know, using that as an analogy, I don't think that we should then say, well, actually, for purposes of reparations, you're not an adult until you're this age. You understand as that analogy? So I would go with the, I would, I would tend to agree with Dr. Grills about the residency requirement, requirement and keep it consistent with the state's conventions for residency. And then member John Soy. Yeah, I don't want to interrupt the flow of the discussion. Um, but we're, we're searching for perfection, and there isn't going to be perfection. And um, it seems to me conceptually we're battling between two things. One is absolute justice and making it right, and the other part is making it simple and doable, but will also mean cutting people out. And so I don't have any answers, I, and I'm gonna explain something that may or might, may not be analogous, and that's what our community did, Japanese Americans. So 120,000 people uh, ended up in concentration camps. And in 1988, Congress did pass a bill uh, for reparations but the organizers and the strategists and the community had to wrestle with, I'll call it similar issues that we are wrestling with. And that is what is absolute justice on the one hand, and on the other hand, what is doable, what is practical, what can be done. And so certain rules were imposed. For example, out of the 120,000 people, that lost their businesses, they lost their houses, and some lost their lives, not everybody got compensated. And so the legislation, and I'm not saying that was the right thing to do, I'm just saying that's how it ended up, nor am I recommending that this task force do something similar. I'm just explaining basically how, in another part of history, how this was handled. So the law basically said that um, you had to be alive uh, when the legislation passed. So if you, if you died in the camps, and a number did, uh, if you died before the bill passed, which was in 1988, you got nothing. Your heirs got nothing. Uh, the other issue was you had to be in the camps, so it was specifically tied to the harm. And so when the orders uh, to report to detention camps came down in, in California and on, on the West Coast, uh, there were a few that fled the state. They abandoned their homes. They abandoned their businesses because they didn't want to get locked up. And so, and they went to Utah, or they went to East Coast. Um, they had to start all over. They lost everything. 
they got nothing from the, from the reparations bill. They suffered the harm, but they got nothing. And so out of 120,000 people uh, who were imprisoned, and again, I'm not drawing any equivalence whatsoever, but we're talking four years to five years in a concentration camp versus 400 years of enslavement, Jim Crow, and everything else. But just on this specific instance, out of 120,000 people, 80,000 received some form of compensation. And so um, it, was a, it was a hard thing. It created huge controversy within our own community, uh, but the principles that were that guided that was compromising between I, I'll call it absolute justice. Absolute justice would have meant anybody harmed by this whole process should have been included, but that was balanced by what's doable, what's feasible, what what can we get Congress to do? And so, um, again, I'm not saying that, I, you know, looking back, I have regrets on, on people who were not included. I expect that we're gonna have regrets here. Um, but as this thing works its way through the process, and the ultimate process is the legislature, because they will have to determine basically not only with what is justice, but balanced against what is affordable, what's doable. And so I think our job is to at least shine a light on the harm, all of it, and it is enormous. I mean, the numbers we're talking about are big time. But in this first juncture, at least, now we're coming down to where the rubber meets the road and making practical, we call it baseline, uh, sort of the main filter, the, pr the starting filter of who, who's eligible. And um, again, we're not the first group, th this body is not the first group that's, that's wrestled with this question. So I'm not offering any answers, but I I'm saying um, it it's a good process and it's necessary, it but it won't be perfect for sure. Thank you, that was very helpful, Member Tamaki. Uh, Member Montgomery, step, you're recognized and we'll go to Member uh, um, thank you so much, Chair. Um, I, I just have a so the September 30, 2020 date is a is a cutoff date. So if anyone, if we were to decide on that, anyone that moved here and gained re residency um, in the state of California under our eligibility requirements would not be eligible for compensatory um, reparation or the, the amount. The nine months, I, I guess I, my question is, based on my understanding, that's sort of a rolling requirement, right? As people move, they can gain uh, residency nine months after being here, et cetera. I don't know the details. Is that the, is that the, the recommendation here, that, that rolling, there's a rolling requirement? Um, as opposed to a cutoff date? I'm just wondering nine months, nine months from when? What, what, what exactly is that? Uh, I'll go to Member John Sawyer. <clears throat> For the most part, I believe that um, everyone has some sense that there should be some kind of residency um, requirement. Uh, the, the problem is implementation. Um, Probably the only person on this entire committee, maybe, you know, I'm pretty certain I can say in this room, who knows what it's like to have the public, an advisory group, or even a legislative group, then make a decision and then foist it on the bureaucracy to get it done. And then when it blows up, we're all mad at the bureaucracy. Like right now, who's going to administer all this? Who's going to decide I mean, what department? I'm getting into the minutia of it. Who is going to do this? And who has the capacity to write the check? Is, is one group where the controller's office actually writes the check. There's another group that you'll have do something else in another group. Um, that will happen then. And we don't have them in this room to help us decide on how to implement this. If you don't think implementation is really important, Look what happened to EDD. 
we decided we're going to go ahead and do something to help every Californian during the COVID crisis. It was an, it was a disaster, a disaster because we did not think it all the way through. Right now we have the task force, we're going to have the legislative, we're going to have the governor's office, and then we're going to tell a bunch of bureaucrats to get this done. And I think what you're hearing from here is how do we get, how do we get this done? And, uh, and part of this may be bringing in, getting their input, the state of California folk who are going to implement this, or have we decided who's going to implement this, um, in the room to help us with that so we can make these decisions so that it'll be easy, so that it doesn't get corrupted, or there isn't something where things don't go out for a year or two because they can't get their act together. It takes them a year or two to get the computer system up or whatever they need. We need to have them involved in this so that they can hit the ground running to get this done. And I think part of this frustration you're hearing now is how do we make sure that people who need this the most that can trace their 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 harm to chattel slavery. Um, what comes to mind is I keep hearing, you know, if I if I know someone that's going to Cal State, San Diego State right now, they graduated this year, and they left and went back to Alabama where they came from. According to what I'm hearing now, they could be eligible even though they only been here for a hot second. Hot second. And now they're spending our money in another state. That bothers me. That bothers me. And so those those are the little minute little details that we're just going to just say, you guys figure it out. And if they come back and say, we can't do something, then we're going to be unbelievably upset and angry at the state, at the system. And then we don't get what we wanted, what we've been working on for all this time. So my, my as part of my suggestion is, we, we, at some point we got to have a discussion about implementation, and and I, I'm looking at the DOJ people who probably will not. We in the legislature come up with laws all the time that we just say do it, and then they come back and say it's unconstitutional, it's illegal, or we can't do it, and then it doesn't happen. And so I want to make sure we don't have that happen to us, because that ultimately could be a problem. Out. Okay, thank you so much. Just a quick time check. It's 12.16 and, and lunch is scheduled for 12.30 with the understanding that we did kind of go um, beyond time a little bit. But yeah, I just wanted to recap on this this part. And so to um, Member Joe Sawyer's point, in terms of consensus, it seems like most of the task force members agree that there should be some residency requirement, but the jury is still out in terms of how that can be determined. I don't know how helpful it will be if we just go one by one really quickly and just like just summarize what our thoughts are out on this. I'm not sure. Or we can just move on uh, to the next section. But I did want to raise something where, okay, I, you know, I think we all agree that there should be some type of residency requirement. Um, but, but again, there, the jury's still out about how it should be determined. My issue that I'm kind of wrestling with is, okay, let's say there's someone who you know, was in California since the Great Migration. You know, their people came from Alabama, Mississippi. Um, they lived in California from the 30s, let's say up until 2019. They just couldn't take it anymore. They had to go to the South because, you know, they couldn't afford to live in California anymore. Uh, maybe even their property was taken via eminent domain or something like that. Are we saying that that family who's been there for, you know, 60 years, because they left in 2019, you know, a year before Governor Newsom signed the legislation, they shouldn't be eligible. And then on the flip side, I'm just also just trying to get some clarity. Are we saying, let's say there's an African-American family that fits the community of eligibility, so they are a descendant of a free and enslaved black person living in the United States prior to 1900, but let's say they've lived in Texas their entire life and they just moved to California in 2019. Right, a year before uh, Governor Newsom um, signed the legislation. So would that mean that that family then would be eligible for these, the total sum of these five state sanctioned atrocities because they met the residency requirement conveniently so? Like that is kind of the question that we kind of have to uh, wrestle with. And so I just kind of wanted to use those two examples as an illustration of kind of what 
in theory, we're arguing about, we're well, not arguing, but, you know, wrestling over. And maybe if we do do a, re a round robin just to close this second question out, you know, task force members can say, should there be a residency requirement, yes or no? You know, how should it be determined preliminarily? And then maybe what are your thoughts around the, that, those two case studies that I just mentioned? Um, members, hold, uh, sorry, Scott Lewis, you're recognized. <laughs> um, okay, so let's just start from left to right, so like, we can just get this done. Um, Member Girls, do you have any last thoughts on the second part of the question? E excuse me, Chair Moore. Yeah, sure. C You're recognized, Dr. Sprigg. Could you also um, get feedback from the task force on whether they're agreeing to the economic echoes here, I think? was the term you used, or whether it's I am showing harm for the specific issue. So can you speak up? Is, I... is, is there an agreement that there will be a calculation based on an ecosphere, or is it that I demonstrate I have property and um, so in, we're not on that Los question Angeles, yet, Dr. Spriggs. We're not on that question yet. We're still on number two. The question you're raising is number four. So we're getting there. Okay. We just want to wrap up question number two. Um, so Dr. Grills, do you have any closing thoughts on, on question two in terms of should there be a residency requirement? How should it be determined? Um, yes, I, I think I've already stated that I think there should be a residency requirement and how it should be established. I don't have a definitive answer, but my, my leaning is in the direction of something that is simple, that aligns with what's already on the books in California, and that, um, and that includes you know, whatever kind of relevant exclusionary criteria. So for example, for the California residency requirement, for whatever, whatever their reasons for doing it for tax purposes, um, it does state that nine month period, but it also has a clause in there that states you don't qualify essentially if you came here for a transitory purpose, like to go to college in California. And, that, and, and so then, that, you know, and, and again, it's because I wanna make sure that this is, doesn't present an undue burden, doesn't leave it to the bureaucrats to interpret and end up with being a disaster um, and that is inclusive as possible. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Member Montgomery Step. So yes, there should be a, a California residency requirement. Um, I would say that um, if, you know, I understand the purposes of being consistent and can, and definitely open to that. I think it would have to be a cutoff date if we did the September 30, 2020, um, and, and nine months from that date um, would be fine, but not like a rolling, uh, rolling requirement. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bradford. Yes, without a doubt, there needs to be a residency requirement, but I'm going to be careful in stating residency versus domicile. And our Constitution speaks to being domiciled versus a resident. And a domicile is a fixed location which you plan to return. So you have to be domiciled here. And because a, a military person who, you know, is from Texas and comes here, he's only a resident but he's not permanently domiciled. So that's what I want to be clear that we make sure that folks are domiciled here in California. Uh, Member uh, John Sawyer. Um, residency, but I still don't think we've worked out all the details and clarity to make sure we get what we want and make sure it's so specific, as Dr. Weber said, that there's no ambiguity or no way that people can wiggle through and take advantage of this. Um, keep us from being able to take full advantage of it. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Brown? No comment. Okay, um, Member Holder? Yeah, I do agree that there should be a residency requirement consistent with, with what has already been outlined. And I do want to just get to your concern, um, Chair Moore, because I have the same concern as well, and I think it's valid. But I think, unfortunately, when you have to have standards that are consistent with conventions around these procedural issues, some people are going to get, some, it's going to be unfortunate for some. I mean, 
I, I, don't, I don't like to think that there's people who may have lived in California for 80 years and then left, uh, you know, right before the legislation passed and they're not getting anything. But the bottom line is, all black people have been harmed in this country. And, and, and harmed in very, very similar ways. So if someone ends up getting a quote unquote windfall because they moved here just a few years ago, well, if they're black, they were harmed wherever the hell they were anyway. So I'm not really that worried about it. You know, and for those unfortunate people who did leave the state after living here and suffering this particular state harms for many years, our hope is that the federal government will be pushed into, will be backed into a corner where they have to, um, they have to deal with that harm. Thank you so much for addressing my concerns, Member Helder. Member Tamaki, you're recognized. Yeah, I, I'm in favor of a residency requirement, but uh, <clears throat> realizing we're going to cut people out of this, and, and you, lo you lose people out of it. But to not have a residency, residency requirement, I would think, and this is more in the nature of what um, Member Joan Sawyer and, and Member Bradford would say, we, we also have to come up with something that's that's defensible. And to not have a residency requirement um, politically, in my view, is going to be difficult. So um, again, I'm informed too of what our own community and the hard choices we had to make. So uh, residency requirement makes sense, but there, there are some gross injustices within that that we're buying into. And um, I don't know how those might be fixed or if they can be. Um, but that said, I, I think it makes sense to have a residency, you know, requirement. So I was just saying that I don't think, uh, yes, my sure you recognize. I might want to throw a brick at me for saying that, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> we got to keep in mind that we can express, as we all, our wish list regarding reparations. And all we also be conscious of the reality, the reality, if anything is going to happen, it's not going to be because of the goodness of the heart of politicians, <laughs> and the only way that we will get some measures of strides toward fulfillment. As soon as we get out of that door, we better run and call Ray Ray <laughs> and Samantha and lovingly tell them Get up off of your stools of do nothing and vote. <laughs> Remember, the reality is we are only 6% of this population, and the enemies are still out there. And that man who just got that gavel in that house, yeah. we're right down there yeah. in a place called Bakersfield. Yeah. Yeah. And the isms of that area yeah. is in his bones, his soul, his mind, and his comrades. Yeah. And that's the same area where in 1908, a black Baptist preacher named Alan Allensworth 
tried to establish a Tuskegee here in the West. But they paused in that water and redirected that railroad track. And now the dream of Allensworth became a nightmare. And it's just a park down there. So we got to get busy. We got to convince folk. We got to lobby. And we got to make sure that some force or some good God changes the hard-hearted folks in this state and this nation. They haven't even got a commission established yet nationally. So don't build up our hopes if we have not been working hard. But Frederick Douglass says there's no progress without agitation and work. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd better just lovingly, respectfully say that to you. Okay. Well, it's 12.30 and I want to get uh, some understanding. Should we table the rest of this discussion and then also your committee on the wealth gap to tomorrow for unfinished business? because we have lunch from 1230 to 145, and then we have a panel on tax law where we're inviting people to speak at 145. Table some of the other discussions that, uh, aside from, we, we do have people who are scheduled to come here, but we also have other discussions later on. I, I'd like to continue with this discussion today and table the others for tomorrow. So just, just quickly, you know, uh, this thing here. All right, we're, we're activated now. All right. All I can do is talk. This thing got the other half of the job. Um, so, so just quickly, I, I think the, so of the remaining questions, um, you know, question, question four. First of all, thank you, colleagues, for, for sharing your views and, and Chair Moore for, for, you know, getting them to do so. Um, the... I, I really do feel like question four has effectively been answered with some of the feedback that we've gotten today, right? Um, because question four, just very quickly, colleagues, um, you know, asks if direct victims and or all African-American descendants of U.S. slavery in California uh, be compensated. And what that means specifically, what that would look like specifically, is I lost property in such and such year, so therefore I am eligible for receiving you know, the compensation for that particular atrocity. But what everybody has said so far is that there does seem to be, you know, this interest in a more generalized approach um, to, to simplify things in a way. And so in, in, in that regard, it does sound like the, the task force members are, are in favor of all African-American descendants, right? Parts of the, you know, who are who form part of the eligible community would therefore be eligible for the total sum of reparations offered as long as they meet this uh, residency requirement as we've begun to learn a bit more uh, about. You can talk a little. Um, so, so, you know, so I, I mean, I think as far as I'm concerned, I feel like that answer, you know, as a member of this of this advisory committee, I feel as if that answer uh, has been provided based upon the feedback. Um, and that's why earlier I said that I think questions questions two and four were actually related, um, because if if task force members, you know, indicated their preference for establishing residency, you know, in a particular you know time frame, that would then um, require a secondary question, which is, you, how do you then provide, or should you then provide evidence of facing particular harms? But it sounds like things are are headed in the direction of a more general general eligibility. So, I think maybe we can go away together and then think about about that more, and then come back next meeting, you know, with more precise recommendations. Okay. Thank you. So, to Dr. Spriggs, I think the consensus is we're going with the more echo spheric model. Um, to your point. So, okay, so that means then this um, committee report back is essentially wrapped up. It is, because we can't answer the question five today. Yeah. We can't, we can't, you know. Um, so then that leaves what we're going to do in terms of the next 
item on the agenda, which is your advisory committee on the wealth gap. So, you know, on the wealth gap, quickly, you know, I feel like last, you know, last meeting, you know, um, I explained, you know, some of the, some of the, the kind of um, intricacies of thinking about the wealth gap, you know, as a discrete area. And, and what I explained and what I think we all understood and agreed uh, to was that using the term the wealth gap as a particular harm area wasn't actually necessary because the, 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 the wealth gap was effectively being represented by the five areas that we just discussed. And so the, what, I can, what, I can, what I can provide as an update is that the plan for you know, the recommendations and what I'm working on currently is effectively um, you know, an explainer of that fact right and and that would be added that would be added to you know to you know to the recommendations but you know what we did discuss and what i felt quite resolved around um in in our december meeting was that everybody did kind of understand that you know these five these five atrocities um if effectively worked for the 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 matter of the racial wealth gap um because again going back to my earlier comment about the kind of ecosystem right the, the, the racial wealth gap just for those who may not have been in attendance at last meeting or didn't watch it online the racial wealth gap when thinking about reparations at a federal level represents a total sum of harms african americans have faced from slavery to the contemporary moment so what economists you know like like some of the economists who are on our experts team um are you know advocate for is that the racial wealth gap alone at the federal level that figure effectively represents and compensates for the total sum of harms that African Americans have faced. What we have decided to do in the task force is we have effectively identified 12 areas. And so we're providing remedies based upon these individual areas. Now, if we were to take a racial wealth gap approach, we wouldn't be doing that effectively. We wouldn't be saying, well, here's a number for this, here's a number for that. We would be using the total uh, differential, the, 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 the different value between black and white wealth in the state and saying, well, that difference is what uh, African Americans in the state of California are owed. But that's not the approach that we've taken. And so therefore, having a chapter or a, re a recommendation, as it were, on the racial wealth gap is not necessary because we have effectively responded to it through the 12 areas that we are providing recommendations around. And so that's, that's the update. Right. So that means We'll, you know, we'll go to lunch and then yeah. we'll return at 145, 150 since we started a little bit late. And then we'll go straight into the tax law panel. So for the purposes of these economic advisory committee and the wealth gap committee, we're done. Um, and we'll report back at our next meeting. Thank you.